Heritage and Recognition of Guests, the Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, it is a great pleasure to stand today and welcome everyone back to a day of debate in the Legislature and maybe more uh, people tuned in online uh, today with uh, the inclement weather uh, keeping many people uh, at home today. So to all those who are tuned in, uh, uh, I wish a good day. Also tuned in online are the uh, participants in the uh, uh, PEI Coalition for Women and Government, uh, Women and Governments, Girls and Gender Diverse Youth Parliament. They're tuned in today to watch question period and the proceedings today, and they'll take over these chambers uh, uh, tomorrow and on Saturday uh, on International Women's Day to have a mock parliament uh, and to discuss issues that they're facing and the changes that they'd like to see in our island. So I want to thank all of those who are participating. I hope you have good deliberations. I hope you can enjoy some of our deliberations today. And I sincerely hope we see many of you back in this legislature as elected members of government or opposition in the future, uh, Madam Speaker. I want to also, uh, I feel like the, the legendary uh, curling news uh, um, contributor, Soupy Campbell, who used to keep us updated on the curling news in The Guardian from the Briar, but the PEI's Tyler Smith, of course, is doing exceptionally well uh, and have a big game this afternoon at 4 p.m. against uh, Jamie Cooey from the Yukon with the winner of that game moving into the playoff round, which is pretty rare uh, territory for both Yukon and Prince Edward Island at the National Curling Championships that are the Montana's Briar. Uh, there's a great story uh, around all of this, one of them being the second stone for PEI is Chris Gallant, who is the brother of uh, Brett Gallant, who is... Uh, uh, curler with the Botcher uh, team from uh, Alberta, uh, but uh, is a multiple winner of the Briar and a world champion. Uh, the sons of Peter and Kathy Gallant, who are Canadian mixed curling champions in the past. Uh, so it's an exciting day for them. And a win by PEI today might actually put uh, the two Gallant brothers to square off in the playoff round, which would be really exciting for both of us. So just want again to send out our best wishes to Tyler Smith, the skip, uh, third, Adam Cox, second, Chris Gallant, lead, Edward Boyd, and their coach, Paul Fleming. Uh, and that increased audience we might have today online might evaporate a bit around 4 o'clock when that curling game uh, kicks on. And, and to all of you, we understand uh, there will probably be a few phones in here trying to monitor it as well, I'm sure. Uh, I wanted to also recognize the passing of, uh, of uh, Charlottetown and PEI businessman Jim Casey. I want to send out uh, condolences to his wife, Joan, uh, to uh, his son, uh, of course, Sean Casey. He's been a longtime MP for, the, for Charlottetown. Also to Tim and Joanne, all the grandchildren. Uh, Jim is known for many, many things, but really turned the paternal business uh, from a struggling, failing business in West Royalty to a business that's known the world over for uh, wonderful uh, products. So, uh, and also helped turn around the fortunes at the Atlantic Beef Plant in Borden. Uh, so, uh, just wanted to recognize the significant contributions of Jim Casey uh, and send condolences to his family. I also uh, was uh, sent a, what, what was a, a really wonderful, heartwarming story from that was in the, the Guardian the other day. Uh, from uh, Kensington. Uh, there was a story of the PEI Spudettes, which was a women's hockey team in the 1970s, uh, which were locally dominant, and they won uh, many maritime championships, but went on to win in 1976 the Canadian Open Championship at the Dominion Ladies Tournament in Brampton, Ontario. Uh, when they came home, uh, they were also recognized as the most sportsmanlike team winning the, the, the Ray Morris Sportsmanship Award, picked out of 70 teams from Canada and the United States. Uh, and they won many awards and had many successful championships and trophies, but all was lost in the fire after when the old community gardens uh, arena burned down. Uh, and it was nice to see uh, Dwayne McNeil from Source for Sports in Summerside donate a really beautiful plaque recognizing the wonderful contributions of the PEI Spudettes. Uh, presented that to members of the team with Mayor Rowan Kaisley. And of course, uh, a key member of that team is the Assistant Sergeant at Arms, uh, who is in here most days, uh, June Ramsey, who was June Carpenter then. So I just wanted to say to June and to all of those people, to Dwayne McNeil, what a wonderful recognition of a great story. The, I think the Guardian was called one of the best kept hockey secrets in PEI. 
I don't think that should be a secret anymore. That's a wonderful accomplishment, and it's great to see these things recognized. So, so to June, our Assistant Sergeant at Arms, to all members of the PEI Spudettes, and to Dwayne uh, McNeil for recognizing them, I want to say thank you very much, and it's uh, nice to see those good heartwarming stories from time to time. Madam Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and welcome all those who are watching online, and in particular, uh, the girls uh, and gender diverse youth parliament uh, participants who uh, were to be here today, but due to poor weather conditions, they decided to do it virtually, which is a, a very good decision on their part. Uh, it's better to be safe. I traveled from uh, Tignish this morning, and uh, from Tignish to O'Leary Corner, it was, the roads were quite heavy, and, and then it started, as I progressed towards Charlottetown Moor, the roads were, conditions were getting better. Um, but I do have to um, thank the plow operators who are out on the highways. They do a tremendous job keeping the, the roads uh, clear and passable. And uh, especially in weather like today, I, I really do like to see them on the road. So uh, uh, I want to just give a shout out to them. Um, the weather doesn't seem to be so bad here, but I know, again, around 6.30 when I left this morning, there was quite a considerable amount of snow down the Tignish area. And I just got off Facebook before coming in here. And I know it must, be wor it must have worsened because Shirley's is closed and the co-op is closed. <laughs> But not bad enough to close Eugene's. So whenever that, whenever Eugene's closes, we know we're in for a big one. Yeah. So I also want to congratulate the uh, senior uh, aces in Tignish last night for winning uh, the game in the series of seven. Uh, they are now uh, stand three uh, nothing in that, and look forward to uh, game four. Also attended the Mardi Gras at the Tignish Cooperative uh, Seniors Home last evening, when there must have been about 150 people there. Um, and just had a wonderful time. Every resident uh, participated. Uh, the community came in with floats, as I mentioned yesterday, and uh, I participated in it also, and I came out with a trophy for best costume uh, non-resident. So I do want to thank all of the um, uh, <coughs> organizers of the... Uh, of the, the, of the uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was always dressed as a liberal, yeah. Um, So, and that's for an upcoming uh, presentation with the Tignish, uh, with a, a drama presentation uh, that's put on at the Parish Centre, which is going to take place on March 17th, uh, Sunday evening, and it's going to be a fundraiser for an ultrasound machine for the Western Hospital in Alberton. So this is just an early plug I'll put in for that, and I will mention it a few times more before that day comes. And with that, uh, Madam Speaker, I wish everyone a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to all my colleagues and, and staff and pages today. Um, and as along with uh, everybody else, I'd like to welcome uh, everyone watching from the island, and in particular, Charlottetown Victoria Park, and in particular, uh, the girls and gender diverse folks joining us from the Girls and Gender Diverse uh, Youth Parliament. And I very much look forward to taking part of that and have a member statement on that coming up. So I won't talk too much about it right now. Um, but. Things like this, when I, as I consider the youth parliament that takes place, uh, and this being the first girls and gender diverse parliament taking place, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's just kind of my opportunity to, to stay engaged with, with youth, and, and I really look forward to that, and seeing what may come of this, because it's kind of inspired by the fact that in the last election, we had the, the record numbers of women and gender, gender diverse candidates, and so I look forward to seeing what, what comes of this and, and being a part of it. Um, I'd also like to thank our local SPCA. They're starting a new initiative called the Pet Food Pantry. So they have various partners across the island they'll be working with and delivering pet food to, to those locations where you can stop into their, their location on, um, I always forget the name of the street, but at 309 Sherwood Road. And you can pick up food for your pets because we know that when people are struggling, naturally their pets are going to suffer and so having to choose between filling their own bellies and, and their pets bellies and they're seeing increasing numbers of that and so the really generous initiative and of course they depend widely on the generosity of islanders for this so uh, you can drop off donations of food or cash at the location um, and they would be happy to receive those in order to keep it going. And they also mentioned if, if there's a food bank or a pantry that you access and there is no pet food to contact them and they would see if, what they could do. And I guess lastly today, we've been hearing just record numbers of Good Samaritans stepping up to save lives. And with the, the uh, two most recent increases in fentanyl in our street drug supply, there's just a lot of 
Samaritans just kind of minding their own business and, and running into people in distress. And I know off the top of my head, Michelle Beaton, my neighbor, Christy Phillips, and then most recently, Trina, Trina uh, Shields, as three kind of people just going along minding their own business and having to administer naloxone or Narcan and or performing CPR when those didn't work and, and saved lives doing that. And those are just three of many. So I just want to thank them for that and encourage you, if you don't have an Aloxone Narcan kit, to pick one of those up and, and to keep it with you. And it really just points to the crucial importance of an overdose prevention site in this province, which is something government has been promising for a long time. And I, and I look forward to hearing more about what their plans are, because it does save lives and these lives matter. So I want to thank all the Samaritans who are, are stepping up to do this, because you're saving lives and we appreciate you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to bring greetings in the form of a happy birthday. Uh, I have a resident in Summerside. She turns 91 years of age tomorrow, uh, Sarah Arsenault. Some people may know her as Mrs. Claus. She was a fixture in a lot of our lives when we were kids at the local county fair mall to get our pictures taken with Mrs. Claus. She did it for a number of decades and uh, Sarah's going to be at the McDonald's in Summerside today. Her son Barry's taking her over the McDonald's from 10 until 2. So if you're hearing this and the roads aren't that bad and you want to get out and wish Sarah a happy birthday, make sure you drop on by. She'd love to see everybody. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We are a member from Charlottetown Winslow and the government whip. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, the Premier mentioned there there might be a few more people watching online, and someone who does watch online every day in the heart of Sherwood in uh, beautiful District 10, Charlottetown, Winslow. I just wanted to say hello to uh, Charla, uh, Charlie and Anna Carr, who are uh, faithful watchers of the legislature, so they're uh, hoping for a great debate today. So thank you very much for tuning in, and thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Kensington, Malpec. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to rise today and welcome everybody watching from Kensington Malpec. I hope everybody's doing well today. Uh, we've got a couple birthdays in my family. Uh, one today, uh, my father celebrates today, March 7th. Uh, I'm sure he's not watching, Madam Speaker. He finds the legislature desperate boring, he informs me. Um, and uh, my pride and joy, my oldest daughter, Kennedy, turns 16 tomorrow. Uh, it's a big birthday for her. Uh, as a dad, I'm very proud of her. She's done so much, and uh, I love you. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to all my colleagues in the legislature on this nice wet or snowy day, depending where you're at in the province. A uh, special hello to all my constituents, especially those who are watching online from District 24, Evangeline Miskush. Special shout out to Paula and Ernest Gallant, who are faithful watchers in St. Raphael, and also to my aunt Irene, who's watching, uh, definitely watching today uh, from Le Chinou in Wellington. <coughs> Madam Speaker, I, I rise today especially to, uh, to send a special shout out to a very special lady who is uh, originally from Abrams Village, uh, did uh, manage to move in, uh, in, to Alberton in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, but this lady here by the name of Shalane Gallant, a young individual who's a registered nurse and has been uh, awarded the uh, Carrie Wynn Impact uh, Award for her contribution to health care uh, here in Prince Edward Island. Shalane has been a, you know, a very active member of our community. She started the... Uh, their honor a run to support the Relay for Life. Uh, she's worked at the Somerset Manor at the Prince County Hospital Emergency Department. Uh, was also a, who was a bilingual nurse uh, who became an instructor at the Collège de Lille to train uh, the new RCWs. And she's got a variety of passions, but always attaining to uh, looking forward to working with uh, seniors in our community. So I just wanted to send a special shout out to Shalane. Thank you, ma'am. Charlottetown West Royalty. Speaker, and uh, welcome everybody watching from Charlottetown uh, West Royalty, especially those watching from Charlotte Court today. Um, I just want to echo what the, the Premier mentioned too uh, with the passing of Jim Casey. He was a constituent of District 14. I've had many great conversations with him and Joanne, and I, I too am sending condolences to the family. And it was very special to read some of the online condolences and to see what what a what a great contributor to PEI um, he was in in general. So my condolences to Sean and the family, and uh, I, I appreciate what the premier said. And uh, condolences once again. Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, 
Madam Speaker, welcome back to all my colleagues and hello to everyone tuning in from across the island online. Uh, and especially a, a huge uh, hello to our, the 29 young people who have were, had to pivot today. They were planning on coming in person, um, but are joining us virtually, uh, each of whom who has been chosen to participate in the first ever gender, Girls and Gender Diverse Youth Parliament. So I hope you'll find this week fun, exciting, and inspiring, of course. This week is about empowering you, the future leaders of tomorrow, and amplifying the voice of girls and gender diverse islanders. I was asked to give you a piece of advice today, and that is to never underestimate the power of your voice. Listen well, and when it is your turn to speak, speak with truth and with confidence. The future of our province lies in your hands, and your ideas and convictions can spark real change. Finally, always remember that politics is not just about winning debates. It's about solving problems, making life better for others, and standing up for what you believe in. I hope you have a fantastic week, and I would certainly be remiss if I didn't thank the Coalition for Women in Government under the leadership of Executive Director Sarah Outram for this initiative, and the financial, which the financial support for this initiative actually comes from the Women's Secretariat. Um, so thank you all, and uh, I look forward to meeting you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of uh, Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody from District 22 here today, especially my, my family members. I think I have Mizey and Judy and Butch watching out there. Thanks for tuning in all the time. They're all retired, so they're able to do that, <laughs> unlike me. Um, I just want to echo what the leader from the third party had said about the wonderful Samaritans coming along these these situations that are that are so difficult and um, uh, with Trina Shields along with her was uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Lori Culleton. She was she was on the scene with um, with Trina, and they worked together to to save this young person. They came along a vehicle, and and uh, anyway, that was in distress, and they 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 saved that person. And I just want to uh, mention Lori. So thank you for that opportunity. Statements by members, beginning with the uh, member from Charlottetown, Winslow. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I rise with pleasure today to acknowledge Kent and Inger Scales, who recently made a generous $100,000 donation to the Holland College's Thrive Campaign. The Thrive Campaign is a special fundraising initiative to establish a Centre for Student Wellness, Resilience and Success at Holland College. Thrive Campaign is a $2.5 million initiative which will support the Charlottetown Campus Student Wellness Centre project. This donation will add substantially to the redevelopment of the Prince of Wales campus on Kent Street in Charlottetown, which is currently undergoing a $5.9 million renovation. The Centre will offer a collaborative range of services to students at campuses across the island via satellite offerings, which will include mental health supports, a health clinic, academic support services, and career and academic counselling. Kent Scales, who is from District 10, had volunteered extensively in a variety of leadership roles with many organizations across the island. He served on the board of Holland College Foundation since 2018 and is currently the board's chair. Kent Scales is a well-established island entrepreneur and CEO of the Scales Group of Companies, which includes Robbins Donuts, Service Master, and Kensington Agricultural Services. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, excuse me, most of us have a connection of some sort to Holland College as graduates, as family of students and staff, or as co-workers with a graduate. Um, if you are interested in supporting the Thrive Campaign, you can make a donation online at the Holland College website or by contacting the college. And I do know the Scales family does not give for their recognition, but for the need and the betterment of our community. And I also do want to personally thank Ken and Inger for their continued philanthropy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This Friday, Mar March 8th, we celebrate International Women's Day. I'm looking forward to a weekend full of events in honour of this day. The event, the event I'm most excited about is the Girls and Gender Diverse Youth Parliament. This youth parliament starts today and runs until Saturday afternoon. They were supposed to gather in person today, as was mentioned, and unfortunately, due to the weather, they've had to pivot to virtual meetings. This is the very first Girls and Gender Diverse Youth Parliament, and this very important event is being hosted by the Coalition for Women in Government, and we are very thankful for this organization and all the work they do. Youth encouraged to participate in this parliament are the ones who care deeply about social justice, justice issues and those who want to make change but are unsure how. Over the course of the weekend, participants will discuss and debate local issues they care about, 
develop confidence and communication skills for self-expression, learn the inner workings of our political system and build advocacy toolkits, and have the opportunity to employ what they learn to enact change. The last provincial election had records, a record-setting number of women and gender diverse candidates run. My hope is that this event will inspire young people to put their names forward in the future. There will be an opening reception tomorrow evening on International Women's Day, and they will be moving into Committee of the Whole on Saturday morning, where they will be putting forward and debating motions. I was honoured to be asked to be a part of this, along with my fellow colleagues in the Legislature, and I'm very excited to say that I will be chairing Committee of the Whole on Saturday. While this event is a first, the Rotary Youth Parliament is an annual event that happens here in the Legislature. It is so fun and inspiring, and I know this one will be the same. <coughs> The theme of International Women's Day this year is Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress. I can think of no better way to honour, celebrate and bring this theme to life than through the Girls and Gender Diverse Youth Parliament. I wish all per participants a wonderful and empowering first day and I look forward to meeting you all tomorrow on International Women's Day. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. As you drive along University Avenue, the new medical school stands above everything else. And that seems appropriately symbolic as the push to complete this building and get the school operational <laughs> appears, despite many other long-standing and worsening crises, to stand above everything else. So many people have expressed concerns about the headlong rush to complete the medical school at this time in the absence of solid evidence to support it. The Premier recently told us, and it was reiterated in the budget address, that what finally convinced him that it was needed was the statistic that only one in 11 island students who apply get accepted to medical schools. Madam Speaker, our office worked long and hard to verify that figure, and we couldn't do it, and now I know why. The statistic comes from one cohort in one year for one university. Are you kidding me? <laughs> The, stats. the reality, the truth, is that island students have an acceptance rate that is very much in line with every other province. So if this statistic is what convinced our Premier to push ahead... If this statistic is what convinced our Premier to push ahead against the sage advice of civil servants, independent studies, the Medical Society and other experts, then all islanders should be deeply concerned. I'm very glad that the conversation around the medical school has matured beyond being either for or against it. It's entirely possible to harbour deep concerns about this project, yet be guardedly excited about the long-term possibilities that might unfold. It's also entirely possible to see great promise in the potential of this project, but to ask some very tough questions about how we get, he get from here to there and the harms that will almost in inevitably be inflicted in the near and middle term. What we absolutely must do is to go forward with as much accurate information as we possibly can and be 100% upfront with Islanders about the very real challenges we face. Nobody has ever tried to create a new medical school in a small place in the midst of healthcare system collapse. Let's not kid ourselves about the scope of the obstacles we face, and let's not ever try and kid islanders of its need with bogus statistics or that everything is under control and on track when it so clearly is not. Thank you, Madam Speaker. by members, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. Um, the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, Madam Speaker, on February 29th, the Leader of the Opposition asked questions in the House on Hope Air, Hope Air, which were taken as notice. In 2023, Hope Air assisted 1,318 PEI patients with 3,775 travel arrangements at an average value of $353 per patient. Many family members of patients also benefited from Hope Air support as they were able to travel with and provide valuable assistance to patients in need. Uh, Madam Speaker, yesterday the member for Borden King Cora asked me questions about the Provincial Emergency Operations Committee, 
which portions of which were taken as notice. Madam Speaker, the Provincial Emergency Operations Committee for Critical Care, which addresses issues at both the PCH and QEH, is made up of provincial staff. Within the structure, which follows the same incident command structure as the provincial EMO, the provincial EOC is designed to support the local site emergency response. As such, we have also stood up local EOCs at both the PCH and the QEH. These site EOCs report into the provincial EOC and include PCH and QEH physicians and leaders. The focus is to have provincial decision makers take actions to support the needs identified by local EOCs. The provincial EOC includes the interim CEO, provincial chief communications officer as the inf information offer, Officer, Chief of Medical Affairs and Chief Operating Officers as Cooperation Leads, Chief Innovation and Technology Officer as Planning Section Lead, Chief Nursing and Provincial, Provincial Practice Officer, and Chief Human Resources Officer supporting the Planning Section, the Executive Director of Hospital Services and Patient Flow, and our Emergency Response Director. Director. Finally, there is a Hospital Os Operations Committee that meets several times a week to discuss all hospital issues and reports into the provincial EOC. This group includes physicians from the PCH and Western PEI. Thank you, Ms. Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. A question to the Minister of Health. There is word that another family doctor is leaving the Summerside area. Now, from what I'm told, this will mean a few more thousand Islanders without access to a physician. <coughs> So will the minister please tell this house whether another family doctor is leaving practice in the Summerside area and what is being done to accommodate those patients? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And yes, unfortunately, we were advised that a physician in his mid-70s uh, has been diagnosed with a medical condition. Again, that's personal information, but unfortunately, he's going to have to step away from his practice uh, at this time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So he didn't answer that question, so maybe tomorrow he'll come back with a response about what they're going to do to accommodate the patients. So another question to the Minister of Health. We've been told that about 600 people were removed from the patient registry recently. Will the Minister please explain the process that was used to do this? Were 600 people removed from the patient registry as a result of getting a family physician, or were people simply removed from the registry because they have given up, they passed away, or they moved on to another province? <coughs> The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And yes, we have removed um, some patients from the patient registry. Um, it is a very manual process, unfortunately. Uh, to date, about 600 have been, have been assigned to a medical home or a health care provider. So the numbers on the registry aren't reflective in real time, unfortunately. Um, it's a bit of take one off, put them on. So it does take us, there is a lag in, in updating that, uh, that list. So we will continue to work on the patient registry list. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, question to the Minister of Health. Last October, the Minister took a trip to Denmark. According to the expense reports that were filed, the Air Canada ticket charged to the Minister cost nearly $7,000. I will table that later. Will the Minister please tell the House the reason for such an expensive plane ticket to Denmark? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, again, uh, we did take uh, some people um, to Denmark uh, as part of their world leader in uh, elder care. I think we're the fourth province uh, to actually uh, take that trip to see how they take care of their seniors. Um, again, I think you'll see some uh, actions from that trip in the budget debate that we come up to, but a very beneficial trip. Uh, they are world leaders, and again, Ontario, Manitoba, Nova Scotia were there uh, before us, and it was an extreme example of how they take care of their seniors and uh, help them stay at home longer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So I thought perhaps that the Minister paid for staff members, other staff members to go, $7,000. But I see from the expense reports that the Minister's Assistant Deputy Minister also appears to have two additional plane tickets on the same trip. The first ticket was more than $8,900, and the second ticket was for nearly $3,400. So it's turning into a fairly expensive trip. Then there's uh, 7200 ministerial expense for bus transportation within Denmark. So I assume uh, looking at close to $30,000 for this trip so home. far uh, on a daily, on, on a day, uh, just to go to uh, travel expenses to Denmark. So what was the reason for this trip? 
Uh, thank you. I, I, I do would like to talk about the trip. We did have the opportunity to visit the dementia village that they have uh, in, in Denmark that uh, provides a really good environment for those with patients with dementia. That was one part of the trip. Again, we did visit a couple of manufacturers of really some highly technological advancements that they make over there. Um, they can monitor uh, heart rate and blood pressure and so on, so on and so forth remotely. We actually seen a bed called the roto bed that allows patients uh, to kind of sit up on their own without additional help uh, from uh, RCW staff that we, uh, they're just signing a distribution agreement with uh, a Canadian distributor. So I could go on and on, but I, I would say a very effective trip. Again, we followed four provinces there to learn how they take care of their seniors, and that's what we want to do on Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, questions of the Minister of Housing, Land and <laughs> Communities. Yesterday, the Minister of Environment said, and I quote, we intend to look at Maritime Electric and Summerside Electric and see who the ownership should belong to. Now, this is coming from a minister who seems to lose windmill blades on a regular basis. So I assume the minister responsible for municipalities has discussed this initiative with the city of Summerside. So, Minister, what is the city's reaction to these apparent plans to take over Summerside Electric? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. So when we talk about the affordability of electricity, we want to look at it right across the board and ensure that every islander is, is treated fairly. Uh, I, I'm sure that you haven't done the research, and I'm sure you haven't read the reports, and I'm sure that you won't. But in, in the previous iterations of this, Summerside Electric was looked at as well. And if you look at the most recent commission report that was done in 2012 by the GIZ government, uh, the very first page basically says, we're not interested any further in, in Summerside Electric, ba basically. But if, if you're going to look at uh, who distributes energy in Prince Island, who produces energy in Prince Island, how we can best uh, cost benefit, um, get the best cost benefit to islanders, we have to include all the electricity. I think it's only reasonable. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm the leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, Summerside Electric is, is owned by the city of Summerside. So I'm not sure why we, you would or try to look in to see who the ownership should be of Summerside Electric. I have no idea why. Maybe you should go visit them and find out what they're doing because they seem to be doing something right. So that, that utility that we're talking about generates a great deal of money for the city of Summerside. And I gather a lot of people were quite surprised by the minister's re remarks about taking it over. So I assume the minister in charge of municipalities has this, discussed this concept with various MLAs in the Summerside and surrounding areas. Minister, are they supportive of this move? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I don't know what move. We're, we're commissioning a study like it's been done two different times in the history of Prince of Island, one in 1982 and, and one in 20, 2011, 2012, to look at the future of electricity and who, what ownership it should be. I mean, just because somebody, just because it is some one way today doesn't mean it can't be another way tomorrow. And it doesn't mean that a new model can't benefit Summerside just as much and take some of their own headaches away. Like, like if we're looking at who can own generation, and I've talked in the house here a number of times about community-owned generation so that the money can stay, stay in communities. So I think this would be quite in line for, for summer sides of the world who already own generating assets. Uh, you know, if they, uh, I'm not sure that when we go down the road and have an honest conversation with all of the people in, that are in the mix here, that some won't look and say, Here's, I think this is where we belong because I think we can make more money for our communities this way. So, uh, you know, you can go ahead and keep fear-mongering because that's all you guys are capable of doing. But what we're going to do, Madam Speaker, is do what's best for Islanders. Thank you. Leader of the Opposition. And I look forward for your government to start doing that. Question to the Minister of Economic Development. I've been looking through the Minister's budgetary handouts, and I see a $1 million grant provided to Cavendish Farms as an enrichment investment tax credit. Now, I assume, since this expenditure is listed as a grant, that one of the wealthiest families in Canada will not be required to pay this million dollars back. Is that correct, Minister? Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We work with uh, all our partners here in Prince Edward Island, all our businesses, and we're glad to be able to support and uh, to offer all uh, that we are able to do with our small and local businesses here, and we'll continue to do so. And if it's in a form of a grant or in a form of uh, a loan, we're happy to be able to support all those enterprises here in PEI. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. I'll assume that is a yes. Question to the Minister of Tourism. We know the Minister attended the All-Star NHL game in Toronto. 
He handed out lobster sandwiches and other little gifts to people. Would the minister please tell the House how much does this little junket cost Islanders? Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, <coughs> Sport and Culture. I'm not sure which portion he's referring to, myself, to travel there or to... But I'm sure that will be all posted. I'm not sure he's aware, but that will be posted online when my expenses are posted. <laughs> The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, another question for the same Minister. I assume the Minister watched the game. Minister, who paid for the ticket and did you have lots of fun? The Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Speaker. So, as part of this trip, yes, we had uh, a number of tourism staff there. We had an activation site at the uh, Fan Zone, which we put 30,000 people through. And yes, we were at the All Star Game. As a partner of the NHL, we were there as part of as a part of the partnership, and uh, with the NHL. Leader of the opposition. Okay, let's keep on with the hockey theme. A question to the premier. We know the premier attended the Leafs game in October of 2023. Now he was photographed with an executive from Grant Thornton. Will the premier tell the house who paid for that ticket? The honourable premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, Madam Speaker, I'm not sure. I'd have to double check that. Uh, usually, when we go to these places, we uh, look after those costs. But I'll have to double check to be sure, Madam Speaker. But I did get uh, uh, taken a shot of on the on, on the uh, overhead jumbotron somehow. I don't know. I don't know how they got the head on there, but it, it fit on, and, and lots of people saw. Honourable leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So yesterday in the House, a number of the, the Premier's colleagues were heckling to the effect that the former CEO of Health PEI was a liar. Could, the, could you elaborate on the lies your colleagues were referring to, Premier? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm not familiar with the conversations that were taking place. Uh, those are not words that I have used uh, in here. Uh, maybe you could elaborate more on a question that I could ask for more specifics to. Uh, as I said uh, many times in here, I worked for three plus years with the former CEO of Health PEI. We worked, tried to get some things done, and when he retired, I thanked him for his service. I believe to the opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. A question to the Premier. So I took a look at the expenses uh, reports uh, that were filed by the former MLA for District 19, Jamie Fox. And according to this report, Mr. Fox charged nearly $3,000 in mileage in the five weeks before he was forced by the Premier to resign his seat. Now that's close to $90 in gas every day. And of course, I assume Mr. Fox needed all this money to campaign for Pierre Pelliev. Did this high mileage bill contribute to the Premier's decision to push Mr. Fox out, or was he just part of a larger problem? Honorable Premier. Madam Speaker, I'm not sure I know how to answer this question. I, I assume that as a backbench MLA, there's an ability to reclaim some costs uh, uh, from each caucus. I, I, I haven't been a backbench MLA. Uh, I don't run the caucus. Our caucus has a caucus chair and a government house leader who does that. Uh, I assume they operate within the rules of the Legislative Assembly because that's who we all answer to. Uh, and as to uh, the habits of the former MLA from Borden Kinkora, um, I'm not sure it's useful for me to comment on it beyond uh, what I have here today, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, a shoreline protection moratorium was put in place by this government back on December 1st, 2022, for any new shoreline protection work done in buffer zones. The Legislative Committee recommended Islanders should have the ability to protect their property and should be able to implement plans as a group of property owners. Island landowners are still <coughs> awaiting this moratorium to be lifted so they can protect their properties. Question to the Minister of Environment. Minister, why are you not wanting island landowners to protect their property from the ravages of sea level rise? I'm the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we actually do want to, but we want to do it in a responsible fashion and we want to, just like you said, we, we, don't, we don't want to have one person be able to do a, a massive rock job and then have a negative impact on their neighbours because they, they can't afford to do it or can't do it or whatever. So what the, we went to UPEI and basically asked them to do a research project for us. They came back with a number of recommendations. We're moving forward uh, implementing all of them and in the short term we're working on uh, shoreline management plans in the 17 literal zones that were uh, that were uh, defined, and uh, the very first one actually is in your district, it's Lennox Island, and they're 
uh, very excited to move forward with their shoreline management plan. So uh, we're basically using that as a demo project for how the other 16 will, will fly. We've asked for federal funding to help. Uh, as far as I know, we're going to get it, and uh, we're going to be right back to business. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from O'Leary and Verness. Minister, that's, that's good. I'll say that's somewhat encouraging. But your department had a very good system in place where contractors were provided training to work in buffer zones, and these contractors had all the knowledge and the up-to-date best practices to do such work as a licensed contractor, which your department licensed. And it was doing, had to do this with no permits that were required by the landowner. Why do you feel that these contractors now can't do new shoreline protection work now? Um, Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. Well, I think because there's a moratorium in place, because we, we're going to try to move. Forward. That's why they can't do it to answer the question directly. But it, it's because, as you recall, maybe not everybody in this legislature agrees with what, what you said that the system worked, and there was a lot of people talking about the Point Drosh um, property in particular. And what we said in our department is, let's take a pause, let's have a look at this, let's get experts to, to research this. So we went out and, and reached out to experts so we we have academics studying it because we believe that you know if we can put on a science-based solution that is something that I as a, a politician can stand behind versus you know being uh, accused of hand-picking who gets to do this or or intentionally blocking off beaches or whatever that we follow expert expert advice that's exactly what we're doing uh, we're working as quick as we can to to move this file forward uh, I'm actually quite excited about what we're gonna have left so uh, I'm there's no move to abandon this if that's what you want. We're, we're sticking to our guns. We think we have the right plan here. And uh, we're just asking for a little bit of patience while we put it in place. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm a member from O'Leary and Vernis. Once again, Minister, here, but here's what's the reality of happening in the situation. Now we're seeing work that's done for upgrades to existing uh, structures by, say, one individual, but then the neighbor next door who didn't have any particular structures is, is not able to do any protection to their own property. So what you're doing is you're, you're causing another problem in, in the way your situation is done here. So, uh, Minister, is this fair at all? And when will you lift this moratorium? And you have had over a year here, and we've got nothing done. I'm the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So we will lift the moratorium in, in each literal zone as the shoreline management plan gets in place. So Lennox Island will be the first one lifted. It will be lifted as soon as their plan is in place. We have two more following right on their heels. They'll be lifted right away. I've instructed my staff that all 17 shoreline management plans need to be done as soon as possible so, so that we can lift them. What I can say is if you have somebody that, that you think is being negatively impacted by erosion because of, what, of something the neighbor has done, or in cases where we have a neighbor on each side of a property of shoreline protection and, and one dozen, and they think that they're going to lose their, some of their critical infrastructure, come to us and we will deal with it. We're not looking to put people in her, under hardship. We want to work with Islanders, so we'll absolutely do what's right by those people. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A question to the Minister of Housing, <coughs> Lands, and Communities. In my district, um, Charlotte Court, which I brought questions to you before about and talked about sub pumps, um, th it's they're, they're going through a lot right now because, again, once again, we find out it's leaking again today. The basement's full of water. Um, there's a serious problem. There's a lake in between these two long-term care. Not, they're not long-term care facilities, but we're seniors that you represent live. Minister, I want you to, to do something about this issue, investigate it, because the water is coming in and the residents are coming to me. I will table a letter that, I wrote, that I, I'm going to table today, as well as pictures from my visit there on Monday. Minister, what are you going to do about the situation for my constituents? Honorable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, um, and thank you to the member for bringing this to, to our attention. And we do have staff inquiring about the, the problem now. Um, the building is privately owned. Um, we do lease units in that building, uh, and we put uh, clients of our, our department in that building. So. We are reaching out on behalf of the clients, our clients that live in that building, to the property owner to, to have the issue addressed. Uh, if it's a uh, structural or a landscape issue, it should be addressed um, uh, to prevent water from getting in the basement. I understand that it's getting into some storage areas where people keep their belongings. And so we'll advocate on behalf of uh, our clients who are tenants in that building. 
The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Minister. Because um, uh, there, there's mold forming too as well in there. But a question to the Minister of Finance. Um, Minister of Finance, you said in your budget there was more of the same. Um, but what, one of the areas that I don't think should be more of the same is out-of-province health services, which are on the rise. In 23-24, the government spent more than $63 million on out-of-province services. But in the current budget, they've only allocated $53 million in, in your budget. Um, and, and how can there be an, a, a $10 million projection for next year less than it was this year? It doesn't make sense. seems like an area we should be spending on. Minister of Finance, do you find this very strange that we're trying to underspend $10 million in out-of-province health care services? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, we certainly know that he doesn't have a CA designation. Um, but again, on the budget side, again, we do have to put a number there that we feel is accurate for the use that it has on out-of-province travel. Uh, I, believe, I, I believe it was about $55 million, um, in, in another year that I looked at. So again, we try to estimate um, what those costs will be in the budget process. Um, it is difficult to estimate who will require service uh, in outer province, but it's something that we do. And again, we're proud of our partnerships uh, and able to help people get the care that they need. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from Charlton West Royalty. Well, it's 53 million in the budget line, so you don't have your CA either. So um, the, 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 problem, the, the problem with that is these costs are going up. As, as, as the, the services get less and less in Prince Edward Island, we need more and more support from out of province, Minister, and you have not budgeted for that. That number will go up. So I'm asking you, why didn't you have the wherewithal to put that number up where it should be? You're going to overspend. You overspent $10 million just last year. Why is that number static, and what are you going to do about it? And if people need the care that they need off-island, are you going to be there for them? Our Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. We certainly won't make any decisions on transporting any uh, patient to PEI based on money. Uh, we will always uh, ensure that they get the care that they need. Again, we do feel uh, that that number is appropriate in the budget process. But again, if somebody needs care, we're, we're going to be darn make darn sure that they get the care that they need wherever they need it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Public outrage surrounding the Point to Roche development continues to this day. The nasty saga seems to get more and more twisted with each passing season. We, and we recently learned that the much despised development has changed hands again. But exactly who owns it today is far from clear. When privately owned non-resident companies are holding unusual mortgages and receiving promissory notes for millions of dollars from other private companies, you know that this is not a typical island land sale. A question to the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. When this property changed hands recently, why didn't government step in to purchase it and take the opportunity to rectify the problem, such as, as the Minister for Environment just said, the armoring that's blocking the public beach or building being far too close to the water? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so the property changed hands between two private property owners. The transaction uh, uh, came through uh, Executive Council with a recommendation from IRAC, like, uh, like most uh, land transactions do. Uh, it was approved in due course, um, uh, like any private transaction. And um, we did not consider purchasing the property because it is a routine transaction between um, uh, private individuals. Um, we've stated, in the, I've stated in this house before that, of course, we're all well aware that it's a very controversial property and the, uh, uh, the seawall, the, the, the armoring that replaced the existing seawall has certainly uh, galvanized people's attention uh, around this whole issue. And I think the, the Minister of Environment, Energy and uh, Climate Action did a good job of explaining uh, why the moratorium, with the, why the moratorium was put in place as a result of this, uh, uh, the public outcry. And um, uh, so we don't make a practice of purchasing properties. Uh, the uh, the seawall was put in place uh, uh, under regulations at the time. The uh, ombudsperson declared it reasonable and within all of the, uh, the regulations that exist. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point, for supplementary. Thanks again, Madam Speaker. So as I understand it, even though the property changed hands at Point de Roche, there was no opportunity for government to secure it. 
um, you know, return the public beach to islanders and move that armoring so that it's doing what it should be doing, namely protecting critical public infrastructure, not, not vain mansions built on a public beach. The most recent deal involved two properties, as the minister just said, the 17 and a half acres on which the monstrosity currently sits and an adjacent piece of land of 47 acres now owned, and I put that in air quotes, by Tim Banks, although it appears that no money has actually changed hands. To the Minister, is that accurate? We are the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Um, I can only attest to who, pur who purchased, sold and purchased properties. And uh, yes, those, those transactions came through Executive Council with a recommendation from uh, Iraq and they were approved uh, in due course as, as uh, dozens of transactions are uh, bi-weekly uh, when we process them. The Honourable Member from New Haven Rocky Point, your second supplementary. Thanks, Madam Speaker. So, as far as we know, Tim Banks hasn't paid any money and the original owners of Point de Roche, non-residents of Prince Edward Island, let's remember, hold the mortgage for both properties, both properties, the 17 and a half acre parcel that was obviously theirs to sell. Their purchase was approved by Cabinet back in September of 2020. And the larger 47 acre piece that was never owned by them, although they now hold the mortgage that was created in the recent deal with Tim Banks. Holding the mortgage, and this is critical, is in the eyes of the Land Protection Act considered the same as owning the land, which as non-residents would be a clear violation of the Land Protection Act. To the same minister, why did you let our most important land ownership law get so badly broken like this on your watch? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, it is the responsibility of IRAC to analyze the ownership of the properties and, and uh, and, and that comes presented to us after they've researched that. Uh, I don't have any insight into who holds mortgages. The, the beneficial ownership of, of corporations or, uh, that are purchasing properties are analyzed at IRAC. They're forwarded to us. They're, uh, they're analyzed for compliance with the Land Protection Act and forwarded to us with a recommendation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, just, just continuing along with this, the 47-acre parcel in Point de Roche that sits next to the smaller parcel with the structure on it and was owned for less than two years by Nicholas Jay, who is an islander, but also the main contractor for the Ontario people building the monstrosity, as my friend from New Haven Rocky Point refer referred to it as. Both these parcels were deeded to Mr. Banks' company last December, and at the same time, the Ontario people building the monstrosity took a mortgage over both parcels, giving them a beneficial interest in both parcels, even though they never received cabinet approval to acquire any interest in the 47-acre parcel. My question is to the Honourable Premier. Is your government aware that last December, the original Ontario owners of the smaller parcel acquired this beneficial interest in the 47-acre parcel without any approval from cabinet? Madam Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question and following on the answers that have been provided thus far by the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Uh, every second Cabinet meeting we get presented with the land transactions uh, from IRAC that go through a process where IRAC goes through each transaction. Uh, they let us know about the ownership structure. Uh, they go through a number of different things and they send it to us. Uh, with a application, they sent it to cabinet uh, with an uh, with an either approval or denial uh, attached to it. Uh, we would have conversations around the table from time to time about why such property would be denied or approved, for example. Uh, and uh, around this particular issue, uh, it came from Iraq with the uh, uh, with the approval. Uh, recommendation, uh, and as the minister said, in due course, uh, executive council accepted that uh, approval. The Honourable Member from Gordon Kinkora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just, I just want to be clear, we're talking about the 47-acre parcel of land, uh, which is the one in, in question at the time. It's presumably been held in trust uh, for the non-residents next door by Nicholas J for less than two years now. Um, it was then deeded to a Tim Banks company just a few months ago, and within a few days of that happening, the Ontario owners of the house next door took a mortgage interest on it without any cabinet approval. Somehow that happened. 
and this would be in contravention of the Lands Protection Act. Thankfully, Madam Speaker, it's not too late for the government to do something about this. Um, my question to the Premier, will your government intervene and direct Iraq to conduct an investigation into the transactions behind the 47-acre parcel? To, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the question. I have to be honest. I, I'm not familiar with the second part of this. I, I, I don't, in my recollection, have, have seen it at the Executive Council table. Uh, I would have to check with staff in Iraq uh, to see. It's not ringing a bell with me at this particular time. Uh, some of the accusations being made in here, I don't know if they're true or untrue. Uh, I, I, I would think that it uh, seems to me that there's some accusations being made here that would be pretty troubling. Uh, you know, there's legal processes in place that would have uh, lawyers and etc. as the Honourable Member would know, who would direct uh, their uh, clients on how to do these things within the scope of the Lands Protections Act. Uh, but uh, as I say, this, it, to my knowledge at least, in my memory, I haven't seen any aspects of this at, at our uh, Executive Council table. The Honourable Member from Borden Concor, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'll be tabling some documents this uh, afternoon to, to speak to the statements I'm making. Uh, Madam Speaker, Islanders need to have confidence that their government is acting and enforcing the laws of our province. Islanders need to have confidence their government is protecting our land, maintaining access to our shorelines and our public beaches. Islanders need to have confidence that the government is working in their interests and not those from away with deep pockets. My question to the Premier, will your government intervene on behalf of the people who elected you and direct that Iraq conduct a second investigation into how the original owners of the Point Darash property, who are from away, acquired interest in all of this land without Executive Council approval? Thank you, Madam Speaker. And to that question, first and foremost, I would say that I will follow the rules and laws of this province as laid out and debated and approved by this legislature. Uh, which is what we do. I am not a student of the law like my colleague from Borden Kinkor is, uh, but uh, you know, a part of our duty here is to uphold the law. Uh, sometimes that, uh, that uh, uh, following the process of the law might be deemed by others to be offensive to what they think is their good nature or the, what they believe is right, but we will always follow that law. I don't direct Iraq. We would have the ability to uh, ask questions back if this were to come to our uh, uh, cabinet table about the decisions. Uh, but there is a process in place. And I would again, some of the language being used here today it sounds very familiar. The member from New Haven, Rocky Point, uh, wanted to, uh, he well, went on a tremendous attack against cottagers, he called them then, the islanders who are here for the summer who buy property. I would like to think we live in an inclusive place where people can come here and make PEI their home either permanently or temporarily. That are, those are the laws of the country. Uh, those are the laws of the province. And for this member to suggest that we should lock out non-residents, I think is pretty troubling language, Madam Speaker. Down Madam Speaker, uh, a little bit of a throwback Thursday. So I remember growing up in the late 1980s and the early 90s watching shows like He-Man and G.I. Joe. Um, great shows. And it's funny because one commercial that really stuck out with me was uh, aerosol cans and how that led to the depletion of our ozone layer. So that was back in the 80s and the 90s. Um, I was, of course, just a little bit younger back then. I had a great mullet and then followed by a great bowl cut. Um, but so I now have conversations with my nine-year-old son and my 12-year-old daughter. My 12-year-old daughter mentioned to me about climate change, and I wanted to follow that up with a conversation with her. So I do know quite a bit about climate change from my role, um, and I also going to ask a question of the Minister of the Environment, Energy, and, Act and Climate Action. So I hear about this a little bit on the radio, but again, driving with my younger children, I don't control the dial very often. So I'm curious as to how the Minister uh, responsible advertises maybe to the youth in our province about things like climate change. Yeah, Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I mean, we're probably not doing anything. I think the Minister of Education, I think they have a lot of good programs uh, going on. I know I've been invited into classrooms a number of times to talk about kind of our initiatives and the, the quality of questions I would get at, like the grade six level, are absolutely amazing. So I find that the students are, are very in, engaged. And uh, But, you know, all that's to say, should we be working with the Department of Education to tailor... Uh, a message that we can deliver via radio or a, a medium that 
that they would hear or see, then I, probably absolutely we should. Thank you. Charlottetown Winslow, your first elementary. Uh, th thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, West Royalty recently did have their science fair, and uh, I didn't get a chance to make it this year, but I did get to uh, check out some of the ones uh, online, and it was cool to see them kind of uh, trying to adapt some of the, uh, you know, some bringing climate into the classroom. Um, it is great also to see their future, um, you know, having a general grasp of climate and climate change here in the province. Um, we do know that youth will be the future of our island, and there'll probably be places like the Clean Tech Park, which is slated to be in the uh, members district a uh, question of the same minister you reference about education I do I've seen stories on CBC about the construction association um, you know partnering with the education department to be in the classroom to help with our housing here in the province I'm wondering uh, minister does your department you mentioned that you have been to grade six classes but does your department have anything to do with any of the classrooms on PEI the Honourable Minister of Environment Energy and Climate Action uh, thank you <coughs> Madam Speaker yeah, I mean, from time to time, I guess it all depends on the teacher. We would have requests come in. We, I've always made my staff available. The folks that are in there, our net zero office, are very good to go and, and talk to classes whenever they're asked. Uh, the folks in our, uh, that work in our energy file, they're really good to go out and, and talk. And we've talked about, you know, are the things that we could do in, in, the, in the classroom. If you go to, to trade shows, you can sometimes see they use the, the, the STEM kits, children's STEM kits, to explain hydrogen and there and you, you'll see um, I, I was at a, a trade show in Halifax and one of the booths was crowded with people as someone was using uh, you know a, a stem set suited for like 12 year olds producing hydrogen and then turning it back into electricity and everybody was amazed so we've always said is there some way we could help partner with ed education to you know p maybe purchase those things to go in the classroom so that the teachers would have the type of uh, resources that we w might think are important as the future kind of uh, comes around the corner. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlottetown Winslow, your second supplementary. Yeah, thank you again, Madam Speaker. So that, that is great to hear, actually, because I'm married to a teacher, and a lot of times teachers want to benefit their classrooms as much as possible. And sometimes, I do know that there is a tax credit for that, but a lot of times teachers will go out of pocket to make their experience for their students better. Um, I'm asking you, Minister, if you will commit to maybe working with the Education Department to be able to bring some funding to help try to bring some of these programs to fruition, like to educate the younger students or younger islanders about uh, climate change here in the province. The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great idea. I think, uh, you know, uh, um, I work with Dr. Farouk quite a bit out, out in St. Peter's at the Climate Lab, and we've, we've helped uh, him create some internship opportunities there last year. This would be with high school students, but he had a group of high school students uh, create a, a buoy, and it was in the news here recently where they... They had a public release, but a buoy that would st study climate change. So they set it out and had a number of controls and switches in it that, that they were able to, to see the currents, the winds, and a number of other attributes that they could uh, study over a long period of time. So yeah, I think there's some great ideas in the classroom. Uh, we've always talked about could we create a climate challenge fund for education, and that's something I'd gladly talk to the Minister of Education about and see if that's something of interest that we could do together. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, one of the obje objectives uh, in the mandate letter from the Department of Justice and Public Safety is to design and implement Prince Edward Island's first domestic violence court. Question to the Minister of Justice and Public Safety, not Auditor General, Attorney General. Uh, can you update the House on what progress is being made to establish the province's first court dedicated to domestic violence cases? Minister of Justice and Public Safety. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the, uh, the member for the question. And uh, yes, we were, this is a great question. When we're in, the, in a house, uh, in this house, sometimes we, we're uh, about negativity. And this is a question about a good news. What's happening on our island right now is our therapeutic court. And in January, we launched our, uh, our first therapeutic court, which is domestic violence court. And uh, it's something that uh, was mandated, you're right, and uh, we're so excited to be able to launch it. And I want to thank the Provincial Court and uh, Chief Judge Lance for their support and their partnership in this, because it's a different way of looking at uh, our justice. It's, it's a problem-solving approach to our, our justice system, and it's a, a way of the future and a way that we want to take our, our approach going forward. Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Domestic and inner partner, intimate partner violence is hurting our society, damaging people, damaging relationships, damaging families, and damaging our communities. Question to the Minister of Justice of Public Safety and Attorney General. How will this new domestic violence court differ from the traditional court process? Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the member for the question. And it, it's, a, it's a wraparound service. It's, it's, a, it's an approach that, uh, it's an upstream approach. We have to solve the problems of domestic violence before we can fix domestic violence. It's, it's unfortunate that we have to deal with domestic violence on this island, but it's here, it's everywhere across this island, and we have to deal with it. And this therapeutic approach, it puts, uh, uh, I went to a court in Halifax. It was the first one. I, it's one of those times when you see uh, I, our whole department went to watch it in Halifax. Sorry, Ms. Madam Speaker, if I'm taking too long here, but something that's very important to me. Um, it's, a, it's a court of second chances. It not only helps the offender to deal with his issues, it helps the victim. With victim service wrapped around the approach of helping solve the problems of our society, we're not just incarcerating, we're helping solve the issue. So it, the, as we can move forward on this, the better off island will be, better for our justice system, better for our islanders as a whole. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And this is great to hear because I honestly believe that we need to work with both parties um, when it comes to domestic violence. And both parties need to learn to make better choices um, because when we know better, we do better. Um, creating a domestic violence court on Prince Edward Island has long been a goal championed by many advocates, law enforcement, court officials. And I'm glad to see the process being made on this important goal by the minister and his department to make it a reality. Um, question to the minister, same minister. Are these plans to, are there plans to establish other therapeutic courts within our province? Minister of Justice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, yeah, it is very important and thank you for these questions as well. And it's, we are, uh, the, this is phase one of our therapeutic courts. Uh, phase two is gonna be mental health. Uh, we have to build the resources around that to make sure we have the programming to help it. And then our third phase is going to be addictions. We got to stop just incarcerating people with mental health, people with addictions. We have to help that upstream approach, that wraparound service before they get to the justice system so we can help them. Uh, I want to invite the member across to to come with me to a domestic violence court someday. They're open, open to the public and we can, we can view that together. And I think uh, going forward, it's a great, great for Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member, or sorry, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, final question. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So we all know um, that the Premier took a road trip to attend the Winter Classic in Boston. And we know he took two staff with him. And we know he drove through the night to get there uh, after his levy and didn't, uh, that didn't end until 4.30 p.m. that day. And we know that the, yeah, you hid the expenses until after the 2023 election. So yesterday you said you didn't know why these expenses were buried for four full months. So question to the Premier. Have you found out why your expenses from the Boston Winter Classic trip were not filed on time? Honourable Premier. Uh, uh, Madam Speaker, as I said yesterday, uh, we're obligated to report all of our expenses on a quarterly basis uh, around the time of that quarterly filing. Uh, of course, there was a provincial election taking place. Uh, government goes into caretaker mode at that point. Uh, the minute uh, that the election ended, and uh, uh, which I would say in an overwhelmingly favorable tone toward our government, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, staff uh, completed the filings and uh, did so as we're obligated to do. End of question period. Uh, statements by ministers, starting with the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. How about this? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Today we're planning to have our first ever plein, uh, PEI Clean Tech collaboration, or collaboration, Collaborators event in Charlottetown. Unfortunately, it was postponed because of the weather. And I look forward to attending it when it's rescheduled. It's great that clean tech is on the minds of islanders, whether it be in the general public, island academics, or businesses and in, in industry. This was a free event open to the public, but tickets were snapped up within days. This is proof that there's great interest in this topic here in Prince Edward Island. 
Uh, Sandra Moore at the Clean Tech Academy and Innovation Center and her team are working hard laying the foundation for a uh, Clean Tech Learning Hub in Prince Edward Island. To further support Clean Tech and PEI, my department is offering a new funding opportunity. The new Clean Tech Research and Innovation Fund will provide up to $500,000 to PEI businesses, educational institutes, or Indigenous communities. The funding will help research and development that contributes to the, the clean tech industry on Prince Edward Island. El eligible projects should be in renewable energy, grid resiliency, or other sustainable technology ideas. When developing any new technology, we know that uh, finances, financial struggles uh, can often stifle the process towards innovation. Providing funding support to get clean tech ideas off the ground will help PEI become a world leader in sustainable technologies. As we move forward in the construction of a clean tech park, this fund is another step towards making a lasting change in the sustainability of our province. PEI businesses, educational institutes, and Indigenous communities can apply now for the Clean Tech uh, Research Fund at cleantechpei.ca. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Verness. Uh, thanks for that announcement, Minister. I mean, obviously, if this forum does wind up getting uh, rescheduled and, and taking place, that's a good thing. I think all Islanders want to see us use the most cleanest technology that we possibly can. But I have to say that this government hasn't done a very good job of uh, living by its deeds and its words. Uh, uh, Madam Speaker, we certainly seen the situation. I asked a question yesterday about MB Power if they were going to be uh, purchasing uh, clean uh, carbon neutral energy to generate the power while they're shut down for 100 days uh, starting on April 8th. And this minister said, well, it doesn't matter. You get the cheapest power we can get it. As long as you get it somewhere else, it doesn't affect us. You know, that's, that's sort of a little hypocritical, uh, Madam Speaker, in the way we're trying to uh, emphasize and promote clean Technology. The same thing goes with our uh, wind farm in Hermanville. Most of the blades are falling off and rusty. Can't get them up and running. So uh, I, I think, well, so we've still got, got to get 10 going here. But anyway, at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, I'll say it's a good thing that we're promoting clean technology and try to be as uh, carbon friendly as we possibly can here in Prince Edward Island. I just hope that this government starts to fulfill its obligations and live by its uh, actions uh, in future, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Madam Speaker, I really appreciate this announcement from the Minister of Environment and Energy and Climate Action. And uh, Going back to 2018, um, when there were only two Green members in the House at that time, uh, we passed our first piece of legislation in the legislature here. And you might have thought maybe that was about forestry or marine protected area or climate change or something. But no, it was on making clean tech a specific strategic sector. And the advantage of actually naming that in legislation is that you can attract more funding more easily and that it signals that Prince Edward Island is a place where um, funding can come, uh, government funding can be attracted without some of the red tape. So making that a strategic sector was actually a very big part of what we see now is the, the blooming uh, clean tech sector here. Uh, the biotech sector was already well established at that point, but things like uh, what's happening in Georgetown and, and the green energy projects that are happening um, have flowed from that. And uh, I'm very proud to stand here and say that that, that, was, uh, that was the first piece of green legislation that we passed here. And the history of uh, commerce here on the world has gone from dirty manufacturing through to clean tech. And PEI is in many respects a leader in that. And, I, and I'm also very proud of, of, of that. The fact that we are building here a sustainable economy for the future, we are creating jobs here in a sector where there is a true future, uh, you know, low use of resources, low, um, uh, low waste uh, coming out the other end, low energy inputs. Um, the biotech and green energy sectors are really the future, I believe, um, of where Prince Edward Island, as we diversi diversify our economy here, needs to, be, needs to look. So I really appreciate this, uh, this announcement from the Minister. I hope that this, uh, the forum that was uh, planned for today will get uh, rescheduled sometime, and that I'm freer than I was today to actually go and attend. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, earlier this year, on January 22nd, the federal government made the decision to temporarily cap new student permit applications for, for students from abroad. I'm rising today to update members on how the province will administer this federal decision. 
To do this, each jurisdiction will have the, um, to implement a common provincial attestation letter system, or PAL system, for the allocation that the federal government provided each province and territory. For Prince Edward Island, that means we received an allotment of 2,000 new student study permit applications, and they have been proportionally prioritized to the island's three public post-secondary institutions based on their respective 2023 study permit applications to Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. That means College de Lille will receive 105, Holland College will receive 710, and UPEI will receive 1,185 of the allotted 2,000 new study permit applications. Once the post-secondary institution confirms a prospective student has accepted their offer, the institution will confirm this information with the department, who will then provide a provincial attestation letter back to the institution to forward along to the prospective student. That student will be required to include the letter as part of their federal study permit application to Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, the federal agency responsible for study permits. Madam Speaker, this is a new process for PEI and all jurisdictions across our country. Staff in the department have been working diligently to understand and operationalize this decision as quickly as possible. We know that this federal decision has a direct impact on our island academic institutions and we are working within the perimeters of it. As we will continue to work with them as we navigate this new process, the federal government is requiring of provinces and territories and our academic institutions for the new study permit applications. As Minister responsible for advanced learning, it is also critical for me to remember our students. Our learners, current and future, must continue to have the access to high quality education opportunities here on the island. I have every confidence that our academic institutions have been working tirelessly to ensure minimal impact impacts are made to, students learn, to the student learning experience. Madam Speaker, conversations with our federal counterparts are ongoing about their policy, and I want to assure all members of this House that as things evolve, we will keep the lines of communication open with our higher education partners. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thanks for that important information, and important information it is, and this is the first we're, we're hearing about details that our province got this, and as the Minister knows, uh, it, it's going to take more than um, uh, communication, it's going to take a, a decision of where this government wants to go. This is, um, I, I, I've talked to UPEI, I've talked to Holland College, they are good institutions that provide great learning for people coming in. It has been a model to bring in and diversify these schools. They do not want anything to change. This policy by the federal government was brought in for certain schools. I know, I know. It was brought in for certain schools. UPI and Holland College aren't one of them. Diversity is a strength and we need this government to stand up and to make sure that they're just being more than a listening partner because I will stand up and say that, that if we don't get the compliment that we had before in the past, it will hurt our institutions at one of the most critical times in our pro provincial history about post-secondary education. So, this has a lot to do with how many you how many you you give out or how many are, are are available and how many kids actually come. The difference between that is a lot. Nobody can predict that, and that's important, Minister. And, and you've been in this field and you know it. But I want to make sure that that UPI Holland College and College de Lille are right at the forefront and that this policy doesn't doesn't hurt them. And we're counting on you, and I'm counting on you as a minister. And I appreciate it. I'm just passionate about this too. I love the diversity of these schools and what it's done for our community. And we have to support more and not reduce less. So thank you, Mister. Thank you, Mister. Speaker. The honourable member from Borden Kincora. Th thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm also, you know. I guess I, I won't have much to speak on the matter, but I will say that I, I'm glad to see that there has been a process established. I think it's important uh, that we uh, attempt to comply with the mandates of the federal counterparts. So having a process is good. Um, I would hope that the process is not going to place a lot of burden on the students themselves with the attestation letter and uh, whatever else might be required. We don't need to place any additional red tape or bureaucracy on top of the students who are coming in and have enough on their minds, enough concerns at the time to deal with as it is. So I think you know, my focus, uh, just from what I'm hearing a few minutes ago, would be the importance to, uh, to look at the student population coming in. And uh, as, uh, as uh, my friend has already said, 
Um, continued dialogue, I think, is going to be important to continue uh, with the federal counterparts, and we would anticipate um, that this government would continue to advocate uh, on behalf of what's best for, for our schools here in Prince Edward Island. Thank you. Presenting and receiving petitions, tabling of documents, uh, the Honorable Minister of in okay. Economic I Development. Document, document. Oh. Oh, okay. uh, no. Honorable Member, <laughs> Honorable Member, I'll call you. Okay. Uh, just wave your hand and I'll make sure I get to you. <laughs> the Honorable Minister of uh, Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg to leave to table information on the Enrich Investment Tax Credit Program. The tax credit is applied to certain capital investments made by businesses which operate within the strategic sectors like bioscience, aerospace and defense, advanced manufacturing and processing and renewable energy and clean technology, for example. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Tell Kerry. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Madam Speaker, by leaving the House, I beg to leave, leave to table a letter dated February 27th from the Medical Society of PEI outlining their desire for and commitment to be involved in the strategic approach. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Years. Madam Speaker, by command of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table the Island Regulatory and Appeals Commission 2022-2023 Annual Report for the period ending March 31st, 2023, and I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. So I'll carry. The Honourable Minister of uh, Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In pursuance of Section 47 of the Financial Administration Act, Revised Statutes of Prince Edward Island, 1988, I beg to submit herewith for your consideration a report of borrowing under Section 46 that has been arranged since the last report dated October 31st, 2023. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Education in early years, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Joel Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from borden Kincora. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and sorry for being out of order. Uh, Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a deed of conveyance dated January 22, sorry, January uh, yeah, 22, 2022, from the estate of James McDonald Redden to Nicholas J. And I move, seconded by the member of New Haven, uh, Rocky Point, that said document be now received and do lie on the table. So I'll carry. carry. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a letter um, to the Minister of Housing from today, along with pictures from Monday uh, about Charlotte Court and to show him that the flooding is real and, and needs to be addressed. Um, and I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Well, Carrie. Carrie. <coughs> the Honourable Member from borden Kincora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just have three, three more. Uh, I beg, uh, sorry, by, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a deed of conveyance dated December 21, 2023, from Nicholas J. to Pan American uh, Properties. And I move seconded by the uh, member from New Haven, Rocky Point, the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Chell Carey. Carey. Member from Borden Kincora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table a uh, deed of conveyance from 251 Kelpie Lane, Inc. to Pan American Properties, Inc dated December 12, 2023, and I move seconded by the member of New Haven, uh, Rocky Point, the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Well, Carrie. Carrie. Member from borden Kincora. Uh, thank you, and finally, Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a uh, limited recourse collateral mortgage uh, from Pan American Properties, Inc., as mortgagor, to 251 Kelpie Lane, Inc., as mortgagee, dated December 15, 2023, and I move, seconded by the uh, member from New Haven, Rocky Point, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Well, Kerry. Kerry. Uh, Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, by leave of the House, I beg to leave table. The Public Expense Disclosure Report for the Assistant Deputy Minister of Health uh, for the Airfare to Denmark for the value of $8,905.72. And I move, seconded by the member from O'Leary and Vernes, the said document be now uh, received and do lie on the table. So Kerry. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, uh, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table public expenses disclosure report for McLean, uh, for Minister of uh, Health 
um, $7,155.81 airfare to Denmark. And I move, seconded by the member from Mullary and Vernesse, the said document be due, be due now received in the line of the table. Shall it carry? Carry. You have the opposition. Thank you, ma Madam Speaker. I leave the House of Big Leave the Table Public Expense Disclosure Report for the Minister of Health <coughs> in the amount of $6,666.59 airfare. And I move, seconded by the member from Mullary and Vernesse, the said document be now received in due line in the table. Shall it carry? Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I leave the House of Big Leave the Table. Uh, former MLA Jamie Fox's mileage of $2,967.13, and I move, seconded by the member from Nolari and Verness, that the said document do now be received and lying the table. Well, Kerry. Kerry. Anyone else? Thank you. Reports by committees, introduction to government bills, government motions, orders of the day government, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the order number one of the day be now read. Shall carry. Carried. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to further consider the grant of supply of His Majesty. Carry. Carry, carry, carry. Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker, please chair committee the whole. The House is now a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supply to His Majesty. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes. Shall I carry? Hi, stranger. Welcome back, Chris. Could you introduce yourself for Hansard again? 
Thank you. Uh, Chris DeRoss, Director of Finance Administration for the Department of Education in early years. Do you have anything to start with, Minister? Shall we back into questions? Yes, uh, oh, we have some take, take backs. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we could answer with those. <laughs> we have a great team. So we uh, left off on page uh, 46, total English education programs and services. We're in French. All right, so I'm just going to read the 7,409,800 again. Shall I carry? And then we'll go into our French education programs and services. And French education programs and services appropriations provide for the development, implementation, and maintenance of all programs of study in French first language early and late French immersions, core French, and the purchase of texts and materials. Appropriations are also provided for cost-shared programs under the official languages and education agreement, and for a variety of services to schools and education authorities in relation to the administration of French programs. Administration, 8,700. Equipment, 27,000. Material supplies and services, 460,000. Salaries, 2,983,000. Travel and training, 40,000. Grants, 198,600. Total French education programs and services, 3,717,300. Uh, Charlton West Charlton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, th I think we were talking about, um, uh, this is an important section, I guess, because we talked a little bit about uh, the, the need of, of French teachers. And in here under bursaries, I know it's a federal bursary. I think I was asking, I just asked one question about the French teacher's bursary. That's a federal government, uh, what is that that is for? Is it federal government funding? Yeah, it's a bursary for French teachers uh, pursuing further education. Charlotte, how much royalty? So are we at the point where we're looking at recruiting French teachers, and is there any bursaries uh, for that uh, in Prince Edward Island? No. Charlotte, how much royalty? I'm oh, sorry, I didn't hear. Not, not beyond the typical George Coles and all the post-secondary grants. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so where are our gaps in terms of, of, of French teachers? Are they hard to find? Have we, have, we, have we struggled to this point, or are we at a full complement of French teachers? That are sort of Thanks uh, we're, for the question. Yeah, we're currently at a full complement, and I give a lot of credit um, to both boards and the department for all that the work that they do. Um, it's certainly, again, I said yesterday, it, this is a challenging, challenging area and we are monitoring the trends co closely. So I'm happy that we are able to uh, receive funding from the federal government to help support our efforts around recruitment and retention. Cheryl, what's your OT? Yeah, and out of the new teachers that you're allocating for in this budget, I know it's in a different section, but could you just talk about what how many of those would be allocated for French teachers? Maybe I know I should probably, I don't know, but should ask in this section or in the next. Do you mean how many are allocated to the French board? Yeah. I'm sorry if I'm into the wrong, made you look. Do you want to wait till that section? Sure, okay. sure. Do you want me to put you back on the list, Charlton Westerhalde? Uh, sure. Um, I just have a, maybe a couple more questions. Yeah, Charlton Westerhalde. Okay. Um, the French Student Exchange is that that's an exchange program for is it for kids to go to Quebec to learn French? Yes. Charlton Westerhalde. How many kids? How many kids are we sending? And it's it's like it's ten thousand dollars every year. But do we want to look at increasing that? I know it's a very successful program with a lot of mm. I think it's good outcomes from it. Mm. For, do we have the amount of We don't have the case? amount, yeah. but the way the director um, <coughs> allocates the 198000 is based on the current year forecast. Yeah. Um, so that's what she uses as the next year budget. Cheryl mm -hmm. okay. so Tanwes Rosie? So, and, but was that, 
not I see it's not increased at all. It's, it's just so she saw last year's and then she just it, it's just a static line. Yeah, like if, if one of these uh, was trending higher and one of them trending lower, she would make adjustments. Oh, it's, you're able to adjust throughout yeah. the department. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, Cheryl Tanwa, Cheryl. That's good for me for now. Uh, leave to the third priority. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for bringing this back and just kind of skimming through it really quick that Mary Beth Rogers Neal is quite a superstar in so many ways. Her name is almost on every, every single thing. Um, a conversation that I've been having a lot lately with, um, with teachers, are, especially resource teachers, is the question about what age is a good age for French immersion to start. I f I'm hearing that conversation more and more, which is really interesting. And so there's a suggestion that's been made by resource teachers in particular that we look at keeping at least kindergarten in English so that there's time to assess um, abilities, time to assess kind of where they are, um, and for us to kind of get to know us, for the school system to kind of get to know the kids and, mm -hmm. and then make it an informed decision whether French is the right thing for them. Is that, are those conversations that the, that's happening in the department about when, about kind of an, when French immersion should start? Thanks for the question. Um, I have been hearing the same um, from some of our frontline staff and actually most recently the director Jacqueline Reed and I had this discussion and she thought, said she'd bring it back to some of her leads for further analysis and discussion. I think it's, um, it warrants a, a deeper dive. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Lead of the third party. I, I appreciate that and I mm -hmm. look forward to kind of seeing where that goes. I find it really interesting. I had no yeah. more questions on the section, but yeah. so I'm good. Show the section, Carrie. Total French education programs and services, 3,717,300, shall carry. Early childhood development. Appropriation provided for early childhood learning, including grants for early year centers, child care centers, funds for the purchase of learning materials and curriculum maintenance and support. Administration, 4,600. Material supplies and services, 113,100. Professional services, 60,100. Salaries, 2,905,100. Travel and training, 37,800. Grants, 69,780,000. Total early childhood development, 72,900,700. Any questions? Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, obviously there's been a lot of discussion on childcare spaces. <laughs> so I'm wondering in this budget, how many new spaces can we expect staffed, all the things that a space needs to be place for a child to go and get childcare. So how many do, can we expect and when, when will those be available? Our hope is to designate an additional three center this year so um, we budgeted Chris I might get you to weigh in with regards to the numbers but the three centers be over 100 over we can successfully do that leave the third priority and so how I'm just not sure how big those centers are how many spaces would that be even approximately yeah that, that's what would be determined <coughs> once once we see like there's a, a couple that the division is speaking to about opening new centers so. mm -hmm. and Oh, Go ahead. No. Sorry, Minister. Yeah, no, and, and just another point. Um, we're aiming for 30% of those to be infant spaces as well. Lead of the third party. That was my next question. Yeah. Um, so with the push to for, for um, daycare, of course, we've lost some after school um, care and, and potentially losing more. So what are we doing to ensure that, that this stops and that we don't lose any more after school care for full-time care. They're both equally important. We just don't want to be putting one over the other or putting one one, one like after-school care in jeopardy mm -hmm. because, you know what I mean? We don't want to be mm -hmm. um, pitting those two things against each mm -hmm. other. Yeah. We, I, I understand and I'm, I appreciate the discussion that we had here in the legislature regarding milestones um, and it's really unfortunate that that's the situation that's happening there. We are seeing examples across the island of new uh, before and after school care programming opening. Um, so there are different organizations that are, are seeing opportunities within schools and outside of schools, um, within community centers, for example, that are, again, we have increased spaces in some areas. So um, again, I think we need to look at this 
as I had said previously, we need to look at this holistically. We are growing our early years um, sector and our spaces. Uh, really proud of the growth that we've seen over the years. Um, and our next area focuses the before and after school care. So um, Carolyn Simpson is the consultant that we've hired to help develop our plan moving forward. And we should be uh, receiving her recommendations here in the next couple of months. Leah, the third party. Thank you, Chair. And after receiving those, those recommendations, mm -hmm. um, is that something that we can expect to see government act on pretty quickly? Like, are those kind of talks in anticipation of that? Because it's great to have the information from the consultant, and we also know that we're in desperate need of these spaces. So is that something that you're kind of working on alongside that, um, that process, that consultant process? Yeah, I, yeah, I haven't... Obviously, the report hasn't um, been submitted yet, but depending on what the recommendations are, I, um, I, I think that we'll move on them as quickly as we can. Uh, again, I think we all know and hear the importance of those before and after school spaces, and I do think there are some opportunities. As I say, we have had some new operators um, start uh, new programs over the last year. Um, I've seen it in my own district. I've seen it in, you know, in, throughout Charlottetown. So there's opportunities there, um, but how can we better support them and the families that are using those services? Yeah. Leader of the third party. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. And so one of the asks that, that we had and, and that was in the capital budget was um, child care spaces on hospital grounds. Yeah. Is that, can, do you have any update on that? Yeah. So the intention is um, in our capital budget um, for, you know, with the location of the old Sherwood mm -hmm. home um, would be to build a new um, building there for residents um, as well as have a child care facility located within it. So it being close proximity to the QEH. And also I understand that the um, PCH Foundation recently purchased some land um, and uh, from my understanding as well, they'd like to incorporate some child care, um, a, a child care facility within that location. So that's um, conversations that I'm looking forward to having. So it is critically important that we have child care close to health care workers. And I think Chris has some additional insights. I was just going to add at the, the QEH resident accommodations and child care space, there's going to be 12,000 square foot child care center with uh, 125 spaces. Mm -hmm. 100. Leave the third party. That's great. And and so I'm assuming, given they're on hospital grounds, that these, um, I, this, I know this is a little bit outside the realm of the, the budget, but those will have flexible hours. They won't be a regular, like, 8 to mm -hmm. 5 or, or whatever. We hope so. We actually mm -hmm. increased the alternate hours budget um, to try to provide more incentives to extend those hours and, mm -hmm. and try to go on weekends and encourage centers to do so. So... One more, and then I put yep. you back on the list. Yep. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so, is, is that something you're doing now with with existing child care centers, trying to get in, provide incentives to get them to work more flexible <clears throat> yeah, hours? Oh. There are some. There's there's limited uh, extended mm -hmm. hours, like sometimes one, two, three hours. Mm -hmm. um, so we added to the budget to try to incentivize mm -hmm. more than that, and, mm -hmm. and perhaps on weekends. We. To add to that, we do have 10 centers currently participating in extended hours. So, yeah. It's, uh... Charlotte, how much royalty? Uh, oh, thanks very much. And um, yeah, this is an important topic, and we've talked a lot about it. So, I appreciate to your staff for, for doing what they can. It's just we're, we're in a we're in a crisis in this in this area. Um, last year in the budget, you talked about um, uh, commissioning a study. Uh, why did it take so long? to get going and, and it's been a year and we're, we're just talking now about waiting another two or three months to get a report from um, the commission uh, the commissionee of the study so it did take some time to develop the parameters of, of what that study would look like yeah. um, and it, it's a pretty exhaustive uh, ask that we put forward um, to look all across PEI and find out what programs exist, what infrastructure exists in different communities. So it, uh, it just simply takes time. Cheryl, how much royalty? It was that is that study just to look at after school and, and uh, programming? 
that one is. Um, we do have another study happening on what the um, early childhood uh, centers might look like for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, it's kind of an extension of the Kathleen Flanagan moving forward report. Yeah. So there's two different reports currently being developed. Sheldon, how much are So both of those, so the one that we referenced um, about the after school, what what was the what's the scope? Is it is was it just the parameters of it you said were were difficult? Were they, are they just looking at after school? Are you looking at funding? Is the province looking at funding the after school programs? Was that a question asked in the scope of that? Yeah, yes, that's absolutely it. I think we're examining all all options, um, locations, staffing, uh, resourcing, all of it. So knowing Carolyn, she's taking a deep dive into all possible options. Cheryl, how much royalty? Um, you described the, the situation with milestones as unfortunate. Um, mm -hmm. That's not that's not what the parents were telling me. They were talking very, they're, they're very worried and scared. And I mean, the minister, you, you didn't have much time to, to, to deal with that. One of the questions that they asked me is why there's two elementary schools mm -hmm. in Stratford. One of the questions that they'll probably want answered is why are we not looking at um, opening up the schools to that service for after school care. So the one of the schools had previously been used for before and after school care um, more recently in that area. Uh, so that is something that is likely being considered currently. I assume those discussions are happening. But as I had said um, earlier in the week, we did have one center come forward with a modification to their license to add an additional 30 uh, before and after school care spaces. And also we have another one that has the potential to um, be able to have another 20 children. So yes. that's 50 there, but no, I agree, the, yeah. the, um, the schools. And that's, um, we, do, we do see success uh, for some before and after school care programs that currently exist in schools. So that would be an option that would be Cheryl, and that's great. And I mean, I was a uh, compliment yeah. the minister on coming to with a solution that's yeah. uh, maybe a solution or potential options. I know it's early, yeah. um, but, but the whole the whole thing was was that we weren't we weren't balanced in our in our in our you're, you're having to focus so much on the early years um, that the school age kids are, are being left apart and the population increasing. There's more and more kids coming out uh, next year that will need that. Um, are these plans um, going to be enough, uh, I guess, for that area and, and other areas that are growing in population? And how are you prioritizing the areas with high density populations in Prince Edward Island? Well, we, on the early years, um, that's per all part of the planning. Uh, we know our um, registry wait lists um, and areas and as it relates to our infrastructure funding and that we are going to be prioritizing based on um, greatest need um, as it relates to before and after school care we are we're really waiting this report until we make some decisions regarding next steps so um, as much as you'd like the answers right now I don't have them for you <laughs> so <laughs> Sheldon uh, West Royalty on early childhood development yeah. Um, so these are all that is important, and obviously we've we've had um, we've we've the experts have come into the standing committee. They've mm -hmm. they've done a great job. One of the questions that I received is that there's different grants going out. Um, uh, it, it was harder for some. Just just what, what what people were coming to me. It was harder for some to navigate. This is totally new. These are childcare experts that are having to look at oh, doing a lot more to get this operational in it kind of maybe stress them out a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, Minister, what are we doing to simplify to simplify this in the future for operators so that they can get busy delivering child care services and not have to worry about the... It, it's good what's happening, but we're, we're... Is our process there? What have we learned from the process to increase child care spaces in Prince Edward Island? Yeah, good question. So I think one of the challenges for a lot of um, operators who would like to get up and running um, is the, it was the, the designation piece and the unknown regarding when the call for designation would occur. And so now it'll be an open designation process. Um, so 
while they are applying for their license, they can also apply for designation. So there'll be continuous intake of designations, and I think that'll really streamline our processing. Again, give them that um, certainty <coughs> that they um, have a better understanding of what their near and long-term yeah. future looks like. So. Uh, we do have some tremendous staff within the department, and uh, I'm sure they were listening to some of those presentations as well, and they'll be um, looking at ways to better streamline the process for um, potential mm -hmm. operators who want to start a child care center. Yeah. Um, but I think, again, that, that designation piece, I think that was, that, that's, that's a big one. Yeah. yeah. That's what they were asking for. Yeah. Sure, Andrew, okay. I agree. I think that was that was important, and I was wondering why. Like at the beginning, you have to set parameters, and now that they're loosening up a little bit, another parameter that was set was to have a 20-year agreement. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just wondering that was at the end of the document, right at the bottom, it said a 20-year agreement. Mm -hmm. um, I heard about that just just because people are are scared about taking that step, but they're also scared about committing for 20 years. Um, in a written document with a partnership with the government. Why was that on there and, and what are we doing? Are we looking at that um, at all in the future? You, are you speaking directly about the low interest loans? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. we do want to ensure that if we are um, providing financing that we uh, know that these operators will um, remain as childcare operators over hopefully a long term. So that's, uh, that's the intent, again, of, uh, of these funds. I don't think that we'll be looking at that, changing that any time soon, unless our finance guru has anything to add to that. Uh, no, nothing to add to that. No. <laughs> One thing we are working on is, is separating the capital <laughs> grant portion from the loan, yeah. so that if a person doesn't need the loan, they can still get the grant. Yeah. Okay. And these are just questions that were brought to me because sure. people don't understand. They're, they yeah. just they, they think that uh, they, they want to participate, and obviously there's a need there. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they really just want to deliver amazing child care, and, and uh, these these kind of things are I wouldn't say roadblock. They they were brought yeah. to me as roadblock, so I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Another issue is that the grants um, obviously were. We're wanting them to expand. We're wanting them to get bigger facilities and do more. But the economy changes at a rapid rate. Mm -hmm. So the money that was allocated, especially in the first rounds, was not enough to, um, this is what I heard, was not enough to complete the renovations necessary. How are you keeping up with both inflation, cost of uh, construction, and how are you adjusting to that um, when, when at the initial go, it, it, it might not be enough to complete what they need to complete to get up and operational. We work really closely with our partners, and that's one thing I think that we're the envy of the country on, is that our department, we have individuals at the, you know, in the highest positions that have worked, you know, as child care operators. So we do work very closely, again, with our operators. Um, when there's a need, we pivot. Um, we had previously provided capital grants. Um, I think I let the cat out of the bag the other day. We are going to be um, announcing some additional grants. So again, we're hearing that um, as a concern, so we, we want to address it. Yeah. Shall the section carry? Well, no, no. I'll, I'll keep going. Need a third party. Chair. So, just uh, back to the conversation about after school care, just for a second. I know that um, one of the parents from Milestones had reached out, and we were having a conversation about after school care in Stratford in particular, and they were saying that um, there was an after school care program that tried to recently provide uh, services at. Stratford Elementary School, but they were turned down. What what does that mean to be turned down? Who makes the decision to turn down um, something like that? My hope is always that we can work together um, for the greater good of the community, really. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure who would have made that decision ultimately, but um, yeah, generally when these you know, if I look at, for example, West Kent, they they um, have a new before and after school care program that got up and running in September. 
the provider, uh, the operator had reached out to West Kent. They worked together. The department was involved. We need to act, we need to issue the license um, to the operator, and it seemed to be, you know, uh, again everybody recognized the importance of providing that um, service within that school. So, I my hope is always that we can get there. Um, but I also understand uh, for staff, um, the teachers they prepare their classrooms for the next day. The custodians they clean their floors and they. You know, they they need to ensure that their their, sc their schools are clean for the next day to be ready for the the kids that are coming in. And so there's lots of extenuating circumstances there. Uh, I wouldn't I don't know the exact details with regards to who turned that down, but happy to look into it. Yeah. Leo Third Perry, Thank you, so I'm hearing that the department was not involved at that stage. Okay. Um, so there's a slight decrease in salary there. I'm just wondering if you can <coughs> is there a, a position positions lost or removed? No, um, in 23-24 we had budgeted 250000 of casual dollars towards uh, a project to update our website um, to make it more streamlined and electronic as far as communicating with the centers on where their enrollments are and, and such. Um, uh, upon further kind of investigation during the year, ITSS can perform that work. So we were able to not spend it in the current year and, and not require it in the next year. Leo, the third priority. Thank you, Chair. Um, and so uh, in the 2022-2023 budget, there was a uh, $1,300,000 for early childhood educator retention uh, rep retention program. And I, I don't see it in this budget. Is that something that we're no longer offering? Oh, it, that's actually the, the pension program. Um, and it's uh, grouped in with the grants to centers because that's essentially what it is. Okay. So now the staff at the centers can um, contribute 4% towards uh, their pension and uh, we match from the employer side. Okay. Leave the third priority. Thanks. So that's just kind of a natural evolution of that? Okay. Um, so the early years education and training fund has decreased over the past couple of years. Can you tell us what this uh, money funds and why it's been decreased? I would assume we're trying to increase training and education. Which lines are you? Um, the, the 847 yeah. down to 843. So there's, there's two parts of that. One of them is uh, tuition grants for people to upgrade their certifications and one is an investment in Holland College programs. The Holland College part is a multi-year um, plan and it just it's slightly lower this year. But the grants have stayed the same on the tuition side. One more, later the third period, put your back on. Okay, that would be great. Um, so we're just wondering what the other early childhood <coughs> education programs are. A bit of it, it decreased quite a bit this year. <coughs> I think it's I think it's the same. Do you mean the eighty six thousand? Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's the same as last year in forecast. There's a, a Francis Session program uh, for to help with uh, uh, French language training, and there's twenty six thousand dollars for a um, like a newcomer program. Leave the third or er, uh, Charlotte yeah. West Road. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, the how many keep, how many families or kids? We we talked about this in the standing committee. Just a lot of questions about uh, wait lists. Is there anything in the budget to deal with the the wait list? There's duplications within centers. Duplicate. That's what I was hearing about. Is there any uh, is there anything in this budget to deal with uh, the wait list issues? So the ECDA manages our. Um, registry as you know and I understand they're always making updates um, to it and making improvements that being said I think you know some of the concerns were around yeah the doubling that that you know, parent or family was you know um, registered at two different centers or three I think ultimately we have to respect a parent's choice so I may have my child in a center but I still want to remain on the wait list for two other centers in order to you know if, if there happens to come a spot available closer to my home um, I don't think we'll be ever be able to eliminate that altogether 
So again, the ECDA is aware of, of some of the concerns that have been raised and um, I know that they're continuously trying to improve um, the, the registry. Sure, I'll tell you what Well, I guess I'm like, we have a budget here and it's like, doesn't that construe the data? Aren't you, uh, w w are we, can we get clear? Like, for example, like, w what is the wait list right now in Prince Edward Island? So currently, um, so sorry, this was at January 18th, 2024. I believe we recently ran it, so there would be more recent. But um, so the total number of children on the registry across PEI requiring care is um, 1,919. And then we break it down by age, um, by location, uh, whether they require care immediately, that's another um, consideration. So if you look at that number, that 1900 number, um, not all of those children would require care immediately because as we know, some, some uh, families would put their child on a wait list the moment they find out they're pregnant or if not before, yeah. Cheryl Taylor, Cheryl. Well, then how many how many infant spots are we short in Prince Edward Island? Uh, so I can tell you that. So currently, uh, well, as of again January eighteenth, the total number of children on the wait list um, between the ages of zero and twenty four months is fourteen hundred. And the system is smart. It re removed duplicates, so you're not you're not seeing any duplicates on here. Cheryl, how Cheryl? So we have 1,400 spots that we're trying that we that we don't have space for infants in Prince Edward Island. Mm -hmm. Is there enough money in this budget to deal with this it growing issue now and into into the future? I, d I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. You know, if we can find the space, if we can find the workers, we'll we'll find the money. Assuming everybody in this legislature and our fine minister of finance agrees, but it's a system build. It's it wasn't. It's not going to be solved overnight. We're doing better than any other jurisdiction in Canada. I um I had a conversation with the federal minister last Monday, and uh, she sings Prince Edward Island's phrases because we really are leading the country. I know the wait lists. It it sometimes it's it's. It's, I, I want all of those children to have a spot in a child care center. Um, there's nothing more than that. But we are, as a province, um, I think we're one of the only provinces that are um, providing matching funds. So we're, out of the 72 million that's being funded, the province is funding 50% of that. Like most other provinces are not ending up. Um, they're expecting the federal government to cover the majority of, of the, the cost. So I think our our province, our government, we are investing, and ultimately we um, we are doing it in a measured way. And appreciate all the partners involved because, again, I I know there's challenges and there's wait lists, but we're doing better than everybody else in Canada. So that's something to be said. Cheryl <laughs> Taylor, Cheryl. Yeah, and Minister, I, I appreciate that answer, and. and uh, for the people I talk to, it's not about money anymore. Mm -hmm. It's about space and access. Mm -hmm. It's 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 you have healthcare, and then right underneath this is very. It's up there mm -hmm. with. This is the next kind of crisis for young families in Prince Edward Island to stay. And I know you're doing everything you, yeah. you can, and and your department is too. It's just these are the these are the stories, and this is the the, the competition that I don't want to see people fighting over a, a space for their infants and mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I know the answer maybe it's mm -hmm. a it's but I, the solutions are coming forward I don't know if they match the crisis at this point I know a lot of people <clears throat> are working hard whether it be an infant center whether it be we've got to look at this so I mean and I appreciate what what you're saying and how we're doing this and mm -hmm. I didn't realize that the number was 1400 and and can you table mm -hmm. some of the numbers to uh in, in your list, uh, if that's possible, can you table the numbers and so, so we can get a clear sense of where the gaps are? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, uh, Shirley and Rush Royalty, can I one more and then I can put you back on the list? Oh. 
Okay, sure. Um, the, Actually, um, I apologize. Sure. There's nobody on my list. You can keep going. Oh, okay. Oh, I do have something yeah, on my list. Yeah, you can move to the honorable member. All right, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So the, the center's operating and capital grants have been um, amalgamated this year. And can you tell us how much you expect to be spent on capital versus, <clears throat> excuse me, versus operating in there? The <coughs> $2.4 million would be capital. Is our estimate new third party? Thank you, Chair. And um, so, what additional resources could family home centers will home, family home centers receive with with increased with increase in funding? We're increasing the grants to family home centers to accommodate the ten dollars a day <laughs> annual. Uh, it just started in January, so there's only three months this year, but there's a whole year next year. Leader, the third party. Thank you, Chair. And is that for all in home? centers or do, is there a certain process that they need to go through in order to qualify for that? They would have to be a licensed family home center. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm wondering if, if there's in this budget or if there's any plans for an evaluation of the pre-K program. Mm. There isn't any a funding budgeted for that. I will go back to the department because that's a very good question. I know, um, I know we're con we have coaches that are constantly um, checking in, ensuring that it's running smoothly and where there's improvements to be made. But let's uh, we'll get you an answer on that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Leave it third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so. Uh, there's not any significant increases to the pre-K program, so is it felt that the, the current budget is meeting all the needs? Yeah, the, the current budget kind of matches our forecast. We did increase it slightly um, because we have heard that the cost of supplies has been increasing, so we are going to increase the funding for that. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. And I don't see a light item for Chance's Best Start here, and I'm wondering if that program if it moved somewhere else? It, it moved uh, two or three years ago to health, I believe. Yeah. It moved to health. Yeah, yeah. not That's just right. this year, though. It was a few yeah. years ago. You're right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm good for that section, Chair. Cheryl, now West Charles. Yeah, um, some of the, the concerns we've had is that, you know, places are taking more, uh, taking on more, which means more staff, which is which is there. But there, there are some gaps in, in what people were telling me was the, well, the pay grades for, for, for cooks and for people in the centers that, that really make it run. Um, that, that, is, there, is there anything in this budget to, to address uh, the needs of the, the support staff around the ECEs and everybody in the facilities? Yeah. We are increasing the um, rates at which our um, cooks are being paid, uh, also our pedagogical staff. So our funding formula um, with the way it, it uh, I might let Chris um, yeah. explain it, but there is increased pedagogical staff depending on how many children you take. Uh, and we have increased the number of pedagogical staff within our centers as well, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> we are increasing. Um, when, when the regulations changed to allow for 125, mm -hmm. we put additional steps in to provide more cooks and more pedagogical staff for those centers that do expand up to those higher ranges. Good, excellent. Yeah. Cheryl, how are Yeah, thanks for that, and that's important. Yeah. And, and what I'm hearing from the centers is that with with more kids, that 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 people, there's more administration, there's more, and I know the, the there's, there's certain positions in, is there room mm -hmm. And is there discussions about putting in an assistant? I, f I don't know what the, 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 I forget what it is now because I'm nervous. Um, but <laughs> at the top, there's, there's, a, there's a, something missing in there, an assistant mm -hmm. director or, or something in there. It's, it, is there, I've heard that that becomes an important position just sheerly on admin and, and amount of children that we're taking on. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something we're looking at. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Shall the section carry? Carry. Autism Services. Appropriation provided for supporting autism intervention services, administration, 8300 
Material supplies and services, 16,600. Salaries, 1,136,300. Travel and training, 33,000. Grants, 1,615,000. Total autism services, 2,809,200. Any questions? Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to the, um, the increased funding uh, and services here. Yeah, um, on the salary side, it's uh, just collective agreement increases. On the grant side, um, there's higher demand for this service, so we've added $360,000 uh, to that budget. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. You kind of answered my next question being, do you see a, a more uptake or more need for this, this program? And it sounds like... Yeah, yeah. Um, there's been more diagnosis in the past year. I think they're getting through them... Um, faster, which is which is great, but it is causing um, some financial pressure on this program um, that we're trying to meet the demand. Lead of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so, do you feel that the the funding that we have now is appropriate, given um, we're getting through the wait list? I imagine is this is this a kind of a fluid number as we get through evaluations? It is a fluid number, and it's this is one section in particular we're keeping a really close eye on. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm happy to hear that because it, it is, you're right, there's a lot a lot more diagnoses, a lot more need. Have we added any, uh, any more autism consultants? Not yet, but that is, that is part of keeping an eye on this one. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I know one of the biggest challenges to, to getting a full diagnosis is lack of, of pathways to do that. And there's a few options for parents um, of a school age, child, school age child to do this and most end up paying out of pocket. Um, so from the perspective of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, mm -hmm. um, it's very obvious to, to see and understand the, the impacts of a quality of education for children who are waiting to get help. So how do you intend to address that? Because I know, I guess, I guess this is a two-part question. What is the wait list like for, for assessment? And, and how, are we, how are we addressing those gaps while a child awaits diagnosis? Mm -hmm. So I am pleased to say we have started negotiations to establish a publicly funded uh, school-age autism diagnosis service. So yeah. That's you know, great. I know it is, yeah. No, so those uh, discussions are underway with education, health, and various departments. Um, in terms of the wait list, that's a challenging one um, around how many school-aged um, children are currently undiagnosed. We don't, we don't have a clear uh, stash, a clear data on that, so that'll be part of this process. Um, that being said, we do know that if a child has um, if a child has any behaviors whereby a teacher feels that an intervention is needed, interventions are provided regardless of a diagnosis or not. Um, but I think it's important that the the families and the children do get that diagnosis, and um, of course, it opens doors for additional supports. So it's an area I'm really passionate about as well. Yeah. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair, and that was going to kind of be my next question because mm -hmm. I, I can't remember the details, but I do remember having this conversation before about yeah. providing interventions mm -hmm. before a diagnosis. So I'm, I'm, I was going to ask if that was still going on, so I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. <coughs> um, so special needs assistance, I know mm -hmm. that those are, uh, those are an early childhood thing, but I'm wondering would that be, would they be funded through, would there be any funded through the autism program? No, those are two different programs. So there's a special needs assistant program in the previous section and the autism assistant program in this section. <coughs> uh, one more, Leader Third Party. Okay. Move on. And um, so are autism assistant wages included on the provincial wage for ECEs? I know that's there. Both the autism assistants and the special needs <coughs> assistants. Uh, we made that change, I think, last year or the year before, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Cheryl, thank you. Yeah, th thank you. And um, we see that here that 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 uh, and and the department does a great job with with this in, in the, the school age. But I'm looking at like last year it was um, 
I know you said there was an increase of three hundred thousand dollars, but that looks that looks flat from what we paid out. So I guess we were we paid out one point six million. We're budgeting one point six million, but shouldn't that number theoretically, if the demand is up, go up? Uh, yeah. So our budget last year is one point two five five million. Our forecast is one point six. So the demand is increasing, and we brought the budget up to our forecast, and and we'll continue to monitor to see if it needs to be increased further. Cheryl, how much royalty? So you overspent last year by that amount. You just brought it up to that number, correct? That's right. Yeah. Cheryl, how much royalty? Shouldn't it rise though? Shouldn't we ask for more? Shouldn't we put more money in this in in that line um, based on demand, need, and and what our projections are? Possibly. We'll see how this year goes, but certainly the demand increased this year was a, a big jump in demand. We haven't experienced that jump in the past, which goes in line with the more diagnosis. So, again, we're, we're, we're not sure if it's going to increase again to that magnitude, but we're going to keep an eye on it. Cheryl, how much royalty? So how many, how many kids were, you said more diagnosed disease, how, how many kids were diagnosed um, last year in Prince Edward Island? I don't think we have the no, answer yeah, to that. Yeah. We have to guess. Ask that question yeah. to see. And Cheryl, how much royalty? I, I'm just making sure, like, it sounded like you, like the minister's passionate about it. I just want to make sure that the money is there because the, the, need, the need is there. I know that mm -hmm. everybody does a, a great job in supporting, but um, it, it's, <clears throat> it, it's, it's, import, it's important, for, especially at the younger age. But um, So l travel and training. So, sorry. I... I got distracted for a second. Um, travel and training is up. So uh, there's more, uh, there's $33,000 in, in training. Um, does that mean that we're, we're going to train more um, or is that travel? Or yeah, it's travel for the autism consultants and it kind of goes in line with the higher demand. Um, the director of this section said, we have higher demand, we need some more travel budgets. So. Cheryl, how much are is the is the training adequate that we're giving out to to consultants when our consultants and, and staff when they're when they're there is is the is the training needs up at all considering the demand is up? Well, there's still the same number of staff, but in speaking with the director, this is the thirty three thousand is what she felt was sufficient. Okay. Okay. That's it. Cheryl, how much uh, shall the section carry? One more, one more question. Sorry. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was so. H how long do we anticipate it will take? I mean, I know we're always adding to the list, but how long do we anticipate it will take to get through the majority of the wait list for assessment? So we have taken the wait list down from, I believe, at one point it was three or four years. It's down to 13 months, which is great. Um, Still not perfect, but but great. But we can get the answer uh, to that for you. And um, yeah, I think there's there's a um, been a lot of focus on this file. So, and uh, again, I know you've been that the early intervention and prevention that's been, I think you know that that uh, certainly resonates within our department and across government as it relates to this file. So, yeah. Just kind Leave of. The third party. Thank you, Chair. One just kind of last. I was. Are you? Do you ever? Um, there's a, a fairly new organization in Charlottetown, Charlottetown Psychological and Therapeutic Services, mm -hmm. and there's a, a pediatrician who's practicing there privately, and he was saying that um, that it would be fairly quick for their organization to to get through the wait list for for all kind of psychological evaluations. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'm curious who right now, what, who's involved in the evaluation process now? How many do we have on that? I think so, We've, Health PEI has added a third psychologist, I believe, um, and that's what's helped us reduce our wait times to 13 months. And there's also the private assessment initiative um, that's been supported and um, administered through the Autism Society, and I understand that's uh, helped around or supported around 50 families, so they're able to cover the cost of a private assessment. Um, but certainly, if there's somebody that we can connect with and perhaps put 
I'll keep my eye in touch with. We're all, always looking for opportunities. I'll yeah. You. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Leave the third party. Just one more quick thing on that, and actually, it's not related to this section, but mm -hmm. just wondering where, where we will see kind of the more is is this a section where we see the general psychological assessments, or are those, are those where would I find those in the budget? If you're referring to the school age, yeah, that would be back in the PSB section. Okay, so we didn't get there yet. No, no right? Yeah. Okay. Shall the section carry? Carry. <laughs> Uh, joint Consortium for School Health. The Joint Consortium for School Health represents education and health ministers across all provinces and territories except Quebec. The organization is responsible for promoting collaboration within and across provincial, territorial, and federal boundaries to improve the health and learning of Canada's children and youth. Administration, 8,000. Material supplies and services, 5,000. Professional services, 52,000. Salaries, 187,800. Total joint consortium for school health, 252,800. Uh, Cheryl, how much are you? Uh, thanks. So this, this would be, a, I guess, a direct transfer from the federal government. <clears throat> yeah. This section is funded uh, by all the Canadian provinces, um, and our contribution to that is $2,700. Cheryl, and what's your OD? So we contribute in, and then we get we we get services, or we get to we. It's 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 about I guess what what are the goals of, of our collective union except for Quebec on this in this file? Yeah, we're the host of the consortium, but like we're the host province. Mm -hmm. This year, Cheryl, and what's your OD? For the last ten plus years. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, so. Um, what do we? What do we? What is? What do we do for? Like, is this? Is this setting the tone for what we're trying to do for youth and children? It, it's very. It's kind of vague. The description mm -hmm. of. Yeah. yeah, the priorities each year are kind of set by all the provinces. They all have a voice around the table. Um, like in the current year, they're developing Canadian standards for indicators for health promotions at schools, uh, program valuation frameworks, and data collection tools. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, Cheryl, down by Cheryl. I was just, I was just wondering. It's, it's health promotion. It's, it's, it's vague, but I want. To, I'm, I'm a huge fan of health promotion for kids. So I was just saying if there's any specific theme. So, but that's, that's about all I can ask in this section. Thank you. Yeah. Leader of the third party. My question has been answered. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Provincial libraries, public library services, appropriations provided for the management and operation of public libraries, and provision of technical services for public libraries. The public library service operates public libraries at 25 locations across the province, with administrative headquarters located in Morrell. The facilities include three French language libraries and French language collections in selected libraries. Administration, 53,300. Equipment, 2,700. Material supplies and services, 306,100. Professional services, 22,000. Salaries, 3,123,200. Travel and training, 30,600. Grants, 6,500. Total public library services, 3,544,400. Shall it say, uh, the third party. Mr. Chair, um, I think that our provincial libraries have evolved into something really cool and offer all kinds of things beyond books. And I'm wondering if there's anything else that, um, that, we're, that the province is planning on rolling out in libraries this year. Uh, I'm not sure what, what new library of things they have planned. Um, <laughs> you, just, you just never know. <laughs> Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And um, do we know, do we have a sense, I'm wondering if you kind of monitor library use, do we have a sense if that, if usage is going up or down? Uh, we, we can bring that back as far as total numbers, but certainly circulation we do track. Yeah, okay. I'm good, Chair, for this. Sorry, you had asked about usage. Um, I just, I know I had spoke with um, Kathleen and she said, if you get the opportunity to, to give this number, please do. The Charlottetown Library Learning Center, um, after its first full year of operations, they attracted over 350,000 visitors in the first year. So wow. I did, well, I did yeah. want to share that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Charlotte, how much are you? Yeah, and I, I just want to compliment the, the start and all the staff there. I know it's been an addition to to the area, uh, an immense success thus far, 
um, and I'm glad that the province has supported it so so thoroughly and, and thank the, uh, the, the the foundation for raising money and getting that off the ground it's really a quite a learning center um, are we are we getting enough uh, minister are we are we getting enough students from from the communities to attend and, and spend time there and, and what what does that look like are we is there a rotation for 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 kids to go there and how does that work Yes, yeah, I would say all age groups are using the library. I'm an avid library user myself. Um, and it's amazing actually, because previously you might not have seen as many teenagers um, studying and university students, but now they seem to really congregate there, which is a wonderful environment for them. Um, lots of programming happening for young kids to to older kids, I, I know. Also, too, we've got a section, the magazine section. I feel it sounds like some of our seniors often they'll they'll go there and they'll spend a lot of hours in that in that uh, magazine section. So it's again a great great for all ages. Sheldon, what's your And I just want to uh, like last thing I'll say too is that you just mentioned magazines. It's almost like you go there like, ooh, what are these magazines from the past kind of thing. Yeah. And normally we can get technology on our phone, but we, we, we use the libraries in so many different ways and it's, mm -hmm. it's so interactive. So I just want to, again, compliment the staff and everybody involved, and especially here, for doing such a great job and, and mm -hmm. bringing back uh, 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 learning tools that are very important. So thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry. Public Archives and Records Office appropriation provided for archives and record management services under the requirements of the Archives and Records Act. Administration 6,900. Equipment 244,000. Material supplies and services 11,400. Professional services 3,000. Salaries 2,485,800. Travel and training 9,400. Total Public Archives and Records Office 2,760,500. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So in 2021, we had the announcement of the or the, a new uh, record recorded information management strategy, and there was a three-year plan. I'm just wondering if you can tell us what funding is in place for this year for that program, and and where we are in that. Uh, not sure what you mean as far as the strategy goes. The um, leader of the third party. Sorry, Chair. Um, the recorded information management strategy. Right. Is yeah. The one box at a time strategy. Yeah. 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 That strategy uh, involved a considerable increase in staffing, which happened last year, um, and also the electronic database records management system, which uh, they're hiring uh, this month a uh, project manager to uh, execute that in the new year. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So is that, has there been, a, I, I heard what you said, but I'm wondering, is that, is that part of the evolution of it, or is that, have we not quite started yet? Which part, the system? Yeah. Leader yeah. of the third party. It has not started yet. They're doing a proof of concept in, in the coming fiscal year, um, and then hoping to roll it out over time. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So this... I was going to ask a question about the underspend um, in the salaries and then the increase in this fiscal year, and it's probably for that position. Uh, the, the underspend in equipment is certainly related to that. The underspend in salaries where there was a couple positions that uh, uh, last spring were difficult to um, fill. Um, so we did have some vacancy savings, um, approximately 10% during the year. Um, but I believe most of the positions are now filled. I think there might be one advertised at the moment. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. And my last question: I'm wondering, are, are any record managers it, are, for this? Are they spread out across departments, or are they all funded through the education department? Uh, they're they're funded here and then assigned out to departments. Okay. Shall the section carry? Uh, Cheryl Hannah West Royalty. Yeah, so I, I'm unfamiliar with it. So the proof of concept starting when and how are we how does that differ for we're not really sure we're gonna move in that direction or is No, they've they've evaluated what the software will be. Um, now this project manager, uh, from what I understand, will spend um, between this month and probably the summer to develop a, a wholesome project plan. And this fall I think is the proof of concept. So 
Cheryl's anybody Cheryl with you? So after the proof of concept runs for how long and then when, <coughs> when should that be operational? Uh, I think that would be the work of the project manager that's about to start. Um, Cheryl, can I watch your OT? No, that's, that's it for me. Another section, section carry? Carry, carry. Uh, Interministerial Women's Secretariat. Appropriation provided to support the functions of the Secretariat, the Advisory Council on the Status of Women and Family Violence Prevention Programs. Administration 29,300. Equipment 1,300. Material supplies and services 720,200, professional services 260,000, salaries 1,045,600, travel and training 16,500, grants 4,252,800, total interministerial women's secretariat 6,325,700. Shall the secretary, uh, Cheryl, or leader of the third priority? Right, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Chair. So I'm wondering what additional positions are being added under the salary increase? Uh, one of them is a, a violence and prevention coordinator, and uh, there's positions funded through the uh, National Action Plan on gender-based violence as well. Leader of the third priority. Thank you, Chair. Um, so what will the additional funding under material supplies and services uh, be for? Yeah, there's... And then there's also the additional increase for this. Yeah, year. so uh, the majority of the increase in this division is related to the National Action Plan on Gender-Based Violence. There's, there's two pages of, of various initiatives and... Uh, I think maybe we can provide that. Uh, it'd be probably the easiest because there's 30 odd different, <coughs> different initiatives um, that meet the agreement, which is online with different pillars. And okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you. So you'll bring that back. So yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, so is, is this where the funding for period poverty comes from? From this. Um, Honorable members, just a reminder to uh, to voice. When you nod, hands your likes when they, they hear the answer right versus the... Sure. Thank you. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So I'm wondering how that works. Is that, is that done through grants? Um, it's in two, two separate places. Um, the, under your grants, on the second line down, there's the period poverty grant program. Mm -hmm. And um, what that would be would be... Grants to food banks, uh, shelters, and post-secondary institutions. So that's the fifteen thousand, and then under materials, uh, supplies, and services, there's fifty thousand dollars, and that's where the school purchasing happens in bulk. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair. And I was, I was a little bit surprised when I saw the the Women's Institute still still raising um, period poverty uh, items, mm -hmm. and products and I'm just wondering because can you kind of run me through what what government does because I I thought it was it kind of covered all the bases so when I saw they were still doing that I was wondering I was hoping that it wasn't because there was a, a gap in in what kind of we said what that you said was happening what was mm -hmm. actually happening so could you do you have a list there of, of yeah. what yeah so we currently provide products to our food banks Blooming House, Chief Mary Bernard, um, Women's Shelter, Lifehouse, Gifts from the Heart, uh, UPI, and Holland College, as well as our, all of our schools. Yeah. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, when I was recently uh, out on a, on a work conference, I noticed that in a few airports, mm -hmm. uh, they had free period products, which I thought was quite brilliant because you know when it happens it happens and if you don't have any money or change you're kind of in trouble um so is that is it something i'm not suggesting you go to airports i know you don't well maybe but uh is it is this something that you plan on extending is this something that you've heard other needs from i think anyone who's come forward we've tried to meet the needs uh of um I know the federal government too, they have been initiative to support period pro poverty. 
Um, to be quite honest, uh, outside of these organizations and schools, like I really haven't heard much more uh, in terms of needs, but we'd be happy to explore uh, any opportunities that exist. And um, I'm always mindful of it myself when I go into um, anywhere really, but public spaces, I think that a lot of them we've, we have covered, so. Um, Sure. Uh, leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. I guess I just was surprised when I still saw them fundraising because it made me yeah. wonder if it wasn't enough, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's something there's something there to perhaps explore a little deeper. Um, so under professional services, what is the um, the gender-based violence disaster response? There's seventy-five thousand dollars of new funding this year. Yeah, that would be part of the National Action Plan. It says responding to gender-based violence impacts of climate change and disaster response, and it's under the social infrastructure and enabling environment pillar of the National Action Plan Agreement. Interesting. Uh, Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the gender-based violence case review process. There's a budget line there for 45000 Yeah, that's to expand case review processes beyond sexual violence to include cases of gender-based violence and build on the case review processes in place for sexual violence. And it's under the responsive justice system pillar of the National Action Plan. I'll do the third party. One more and then I put you back on the list. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and the, the trauma and violence informed training, there's a line there for 45,000. I'm wondering who, who this training is for. Yeah, that, that line is to develop an integrated plan that will renew, enhance, and sustain training to ensure all providers who interact with survivors and perpetrators have core competencies in trauma-informed care. Great. Uh, Charlotte, how was Charlotte? Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, yeah, a very important section. I think that there's going to be a lot more funding uh, coming to Prince Edward Island to, uh, and to this uh, secretary in the future, and I'm just... <laughs> I'm just grateful for that. Mm -hmm. um, j just a few questions on um, the National Action Plan. I know you said you bring some stuff back. I just said um, I I'm confused about at, at the end where there's some funding that looks like it's la lapsing and looks like a lot more coming. Um, so at the end of our handouts, it says um, uh, protocols and research. Uh, there's, there's no, that looks like the funding's lapsed there. Uh, Gender-based violence training research, uh, Department of Health and Wellness, uh, gender-based violence promotion, innovation, PEI. Are those? Uh, do you, Do you know what those What those are and what? Uh, I wouldn't say lapsing. I would say the agreement has different initiatives each year, okay. and the funding is allocated to depending on which year of the agreement it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah, just I, I I thought that's what it might be. So, yeah. do you know how much how much um, funding additional funding we'll get in Prince Edward Island because of um, the, this national program? Uh, the current year uh, had two point two. The, the 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 year in the budget that we're debating is two point uh, four seven two million, and the current fiscal year that we're in is two point one seven two million. So it goes from two point one seven two up to 2.472, and the next year after that's 2.472 as well, I believe. All right, good, glad to, glad to hear that, that's fantastic. Shell down Usher Ozzy. The National Excellent BIPOC Usher uh, received uh, an increase, uh, com they received money last year and they're, they're getting quite a bit of an increase. What was that project for? Four thousand establish a gender-based violence prevention officer with BIPOC usher. Okay. 
between years two and four of the agreement. Great. Sure. 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 And um, I'm glad to see the immigration and refugee services got an increase too. Would that be a similar thing uh, with, uh, with the position there? Which line, sorry? Um, sorry, Immigration and Refugee Services Association, 62,000, up from 45. That is uh, to increase funding for a counseling position with IRSA under the supporting victims and survivors and their families pillar of the agreement. Thank you very much. Uh, Cheryl Van Winslow. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, my action, my questions were following along the leader of the third party there. I was actually just curious about the National Action Plan, the Interpretation Services, 45,000, and then the following line, the Gender-Based Violence Public Awareness Campaign is down. And I, I don't think you've answered that one yet. I was just kind of curious about that. Mm -hmm. Which line did you say? Um, the National Action Plan, um, this is under the uh, Professional Services. Mm -hmm. And the interpretation services, there's a line there for 45,000. Just curious what that is. And then subsequent, uh, where it mentions right below a gender based violence public awareness campaign was zero the year before it was 44,000. Mm -hmm. Or it was forecasted for 44,000. Might have to bring that one back on okay. the interpretation services. Okay. I, Thank I you. can oh. so, sorry, I can comment on it briefly. It's it's the they're through health. Uh, it's just uh, looking to improve services. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Yeah. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so <clears throat> the gender under gender based violence policies and protocols, there's fifty thousand dollars. I'm wondering what policies and protocols are being developed or reviewed. Do you say is, are you in the grants or their professional services? Uh, not a, I, I'm not under grants yet. Uh, actually, yes, yes, it is. And sorry, which which line and which number? It's fifty thousand gender-based violence policies and protocols. Uh, it's uh, the um, I can oh, weigh I yeah I can weigh in um, the child sexual abuse advisory committee. Um, we're doing a review on child sexual violence, yeah. Protocols the third party? Thank you, Chair. That's very important work in our province, yeah. and I, I'm happy to hear that. Um, so there's interpretation services there for 45000 I'm wondering mm -hmm. what that would be for. Yeah, I think that was the question that the Honourable oh. Member from Charlottetown-Winslow just <coughs> asked, and that's um, to support uh, work through health to improve their services. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So the gender-based violence public awareness campaign received forty-four thousand dollars last year and no funding this year. Why don't you tell us about that campaign and and it's, did that funding end or did the project finish? It would just be the timing of the project within the agreement, um, and the intent was to promote population-specific and evidence-informed public awareness campaigns to prevent gender-based violence. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And um, there's a large increase in grants, which is phenomenal. Um, I'm <laughs> guessing this is largely due to the National Action Plan? For the most part. Um, if you look in your grants document, the um, everything from PEI everything from PEI Advisory Council says women down to PEI Family Violence Prevention Services is provincial. And then after that, it starts National Action Plan grants. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And is that National Action Plan, is that, is that a cost-sharing thing, or is that federal funds? Mm -hmm. Just federal funds. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so there's, uh, we see that some, some of these grants are ending this year and some are continuing on. Can you tell us what, what, um, what, why that is? It would just be the timing of initiatives in the National Action Plan. Lead to the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm wondering about the uptake on the crisis hotline. Um, do you have those numbers there, what, what that looks like? 
So I just noticed there's been a decrease to funding, and I'm just wondering about that. The uh, I, we don't have no the uh, the the stats on that, but we can certainly bring them back. So that's a an agreement over five years with the feds for five hundred thousand. Yeah. And the decrease is simply the in the agreement, like it was scheduled to decrease at that okay. time. Okay. Yeah. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. So. Um, I know that that you said this already, but I'm going to ask it in a different way because I don't quite understand when you were given the numbers. Is this is the national action plan four million dollars a year, or how, what? What is that? Two point one million this year, and then two point four million going forward. Okay. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so, um, when I look at the the PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Center, mm -hmm. you know they. 946,000 that would be obviously for their operating budget. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And so all the the ones Nash listed under the national action plan would there be there would be so I'm assuming that this money is earmarked simply for the work on the national action plan would there be any other cost that an organization such as PA rape and sexual assault center PEI family violence prevention services or any of those organizations listed there would there be any other costs that they would be taking out of there out of that fund i might not have asked that properly but so this funding is simply for the national action plan work there's no other cost that the organization's going to be expected to take out of that that's not related to the action plan is that correct uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean, but on the top part on the provincial grants, we have increased the budget uh, provincially for the PEI Advisory Council status of women. We've increased uh, the women's secretariat grants. We've increased the operating budget to the women's network. Uh, we've increased the operating budgets to PEI rape, sexual assault, and family violence prevention services provincially. And then on top of that, as you can see, the National Action Plan, for example, the PI Rape and Sexual Assault Center, get one hundred thousand dollar grant through that program as well. Okay. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. I guess I guess what I what I'm kind of asking here is so, so like we're not expecting, let's say, PI Family Violence Prevention Services to pay another cost out of that hundred thousand dollars. That hundred thousand dollars is simply for them to do their National Action Plan work. Yes. Is that correct? It's extra money. It, it would have to fall yeah. within the federal agreement priorities or the federal government won't cover it. Yeah. Okay. So they'll have to report back because the federal government has fairly strict rules around re reporting, which is understandable. Um, and so, yeah, so they'll have to report back on the use of those dollars okay. to us, which we'll bring back to the federal government. Interesting. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I ask that only because it's been brought to my attention that there are a couple of, of things that are that they're being asked to pay out of this. I'm going to go back and check on that just because now that I have that information, that's helpful to know. Um, so, did the did the PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Center? I know last time we were advocating hard to increase their funding because of the long wait list that they had, and I know that their wait list is still quite long and and it's quite overwhelming. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, is do you feel, based on what they've asked for, that that's adequate for them to, to get through that wait list? So their core funding has increased from around 450,000 in 2021 to now 872,000. So that's a 90.7 percent increase. Um, and also, they've been get provided with some extra resources to mo move their office space, and $100,000 in funding um, will be provided for this fiscal year for that. So um, I think we work very closely with them, and uh, I think other organizations, they would be the envy. Certainly, I know they work that they do is incredibly <coughs> important, but we've always been there to support them. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I guess I would say they're the envy, but I still don't think that that's enough to help them get through their wait list because mm -hmm. clearly the wait lists are mm -hmm. still long. And mm -hmm. so given, and I, mm -hmm. I know I've said this a lot, but mm -hmm. one in five island children are sexually mm -hmm. abused, I think that this is an mm -hmm. area, as we consider a national action plan, there's mm -hmm. no way that, I, I think that PEI's mm -hmm. 
unique and not in a good way when it comes to that. And so I think that as a province, that's an area where whether we like it or not, whether everyone agrees or not, that's where we need to um, just put a lot of funds. Early intervention and prevention is the only way mm -hmm. that we're going to save money on the other end when it comes mm -hmm. to social issues. And mm -hmm. I guess that's my that's my um, my rant for that. I think one um, um, just one thing that we've often heard is that their desire to do more um, group programming and they were really limited with regards to their space. They didn't really have a boardroom and that. So hopefully with their new. Um, space, they'll be able to provide that type of group program and help to support some of that wait list again. Um, so, again, I think it, it's it's really a substantial increase that we have provided, and um, really hopeful that this will help them. Yeah. Leader of the third party. Chair, I, I, I I don't doubt it will, but I still don't yeah. think it's enough. And it's nice that they won't have water dripping on their heads while they're doing that. So that's so that's great. Um, so I guess uh, does the women's secretariat have any policy re policy reviews being funded this year? I'm not sure. We'd have to take that back. I know, like last year, we did the Leave review. The third on party. Oh, sorry, chair. Thank you. We did last year. We did the review on gender affirming care. So um, I'm just wondering. Uh, you know, if we did it here. So is there any funding for gender-based analysis of, um, for other, is there any additional funding for gender-based analysis? Is there anywhere we're focusing our energy um, on that this year? We have staff in place, as you know, to support that work. We can certainly get back to um, their areas of focus this year. Yep. Um, I'm good. Shall the section carry? carry. Total Department of Education Early Years, $110,348,900. Shall I carry? Should have got you to do this section. Should have got you to do this section. The Commission Scholar du la Francais. Not bad. General, appropriations provided for public instructional and support uh, staff salaries and operation operating grants, administration, 427,900, salaries 21,808,700, maintenance uh, 1,786,900, transportation 1,001,300, 1, program material 251,700, equipment and repairs 84,200, total general 25,360,700. Cheryl Danvo Sherothi. Looks like that we're, we're forecasting uh, an increase in in salaries. Can you just speak to that? Yeah, we um, are adding four teachers, uh, two EA youth service workers, um, one bus driver, and uh, the remaining amount would be collective agreement increases and some carry forward cost of the previous year investments. So, anytime we add teachers in September, it's only a partial year, so we always have some carry forward costs the following year for April, May, June. Cheryl, how much royalty? Yeah, so, so we're adding one bus driver. Is that what they, is that what they, the need is, or is, there, is it, it seeming to be higher than that? Yeah, uh, they, um, they have 34 uh, bus drivers currently, and they uh, wanted to add another route, so we're adding another bus driver for another route. Cheryl, how much royalty? And the four teachers are going to be located in, in what school? Do we know that yet? No, they haven't gone through their school staffing process for the next September yet. Okay. <coughs> Cheryl, how much Cheryl? And just to speak to the two the two EAs, is that enough um, at this time? Were were they short EAs at the time, or? Well, the, these are um, our estimates on what's going to be needed, but uh, certainly when they do their school staffing process, that's when we check back in and say. Was that enough? Cheryl, how much earlier? I see uh, transportation costs are up. Um, we're up o overspent last year and remain about the same level. What, what was the what was the change in that budget line? <clears throat> yeah, we have experienced a, a very expensive year as far as uh, fuel costs go and. We also have uh, a batch of buses at the tail end of their life that were very expensive in their last couple of years. So 
part of them were retired last September, part of them are going to be retired this coming September. Um, and, and that should help ease some of the pressures in that area. Cheryl, anyone else, Cheryl? Is there, was there anything to do with uh, electric buses in that line? Were they expensive to repair in this? They'd still be under warranty. Okay. Cheryl, anyone else, Cheryl? How many, um, how many um, diesel buses are we using out of this budget line? And, and being retired, how many are being retired? And how many are we getting? And if the ones that we're getting, are they electric? Um, I'd have to bring back the stats on how many of the French boards um, overall in the in the overall pool. There's 107 <coughs> electric out of approximately 300 regular routes. Um, how many are PSP versus CSLF? I'd have to bring back. I think CSLF is about half and half. Okay. I'd have to bring that back. <coughs> Cheryl, how is Cheryl? And there's obviously not as many in, in, in here as in the, the English. Uh, is there a agreement to, if, if we get into a need of, uh, you know, if, if there's a need to share, do, do, do both the English and the French uh, share school buses? Uh, they don't share routes, no. so to speak, um, but there's, uh, you know, a spare pool of approximately 50 buses that they both access when needed, both access. if that's what you mean. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, that's it for me. Thank you. Leader the third party. Thank you, Chair. So I know the, the number of students in CSLF has, has grown quite substantially <coughs> in recent years. And is this a, a trend that we expect to see continue? Uh, yeah, uh, we would. It would be the short answer on that. Um, but I can look. Uh, uh, on average, CSLF's growth over the past Five years is about 55 students per year. Wow. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. That's a big number every year. Holy cow. Um, so given that, do we feel that the, the budget for that is sufficient? Uh, <coughs> we met with the superintendent um, with the budget and worked very closely with them. And at this point, we do. But like I said, it's, it's when they do their school staffing process in May, June. We check in then, and the other check-ins in September when actual students um, have arrived at schools and, and see how it's going. Yeah. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so I guess I'm just kind of wondering how we um, how we're going to accommodate that growth. And I and I recognize that this is a um, more of a budget question, but how where are we going to put these students? I know that there's been some infrastructure issues talked about um, so what what are I guess what are those discussions like right now uh, in this particular board that we're referring to in the capital budget we um, did just finish a addition at a cult mayor last year in Summerside and uh, we're in the design phase of an addition at Ecole France of Yacht. Leader the third party. Thank you chair. Uh, so I, I was surprised to hear you say there was only one new school bus driver. I mean, given the, the buses being over capacity and kids being on buses for like an hour and a half and little ones who lucky that they don't have to go to the bathroom in that time. Um, so I guess what, is there any plan to help that? One bus driver is not going to do that. Is there that, any? That's for this board. There's additional staffing in the public schools branch when we get there. Mm -hmm. Leader the third party, and and I appreciate that. I look forward to seeing that. I know, but and I also know that it's the French school board where we're seeing CSLF, where we're seeing those those really long bus rides. And so, do you do you believe that maybe it will? Will one bus driver remedy that issue? We work with the the, tr the superintendent and the director of transportation and that school board to identify needs like that, and um, we have to trust their opinions. Yeah. Leader the third party. Thank you, Chair. And I guess where I kind of get stuck on this is because I know what it's like when schools are advocating for positions. Mm -hmm. They lowball their asks because they know they're never going to get what they need. And so I I believe that that's that your meetings. I, I believe you. Uh, I guess I just fear that perhaps they're lowballing that because the issues, I just can't imagine one bus driver is going to fix this issue. But I'm going to I'm going to trust that 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 it will, um, mm -hmm. and keep an eye on that. Uh, so, 
do you, so have you, do you hear, is, okay, I'm gonna leave that. Uh, what I, special I projects are under the superintendent's office? Mm -hmm. Minister, go ahead. So, so you, you are aware CSLF is going through, they went through consultation and they are going to be doing some rezoning and as part of that, um, they will be trying to, um, well, one of the considerations of course is bus, time on bus. So I know um, that they, they are looking at that and they don't want children, you know, on a bus for longer than an hour. So we will, once those plans roll out around the new zones, hopefully we'll be able to see some decreased time on bus, yeah. And, ho and we are hoping that that one, that we rec I recently met with Gislan, I think um, with some of the work that they're doing around the rezoning and, and the addition of a, a bus route, I think, like we, I think we will see some improvements moving forward. Yeah. The other so I'm yeah. conscious of the time, Chair. I think we're just going to try and get through this section, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I'm really happy to hear that, mm -hmm. the, a review happening. And I, so that's, um, I look forward to kind of seeing what, yeah. what that brings. So I'm wondering about psychologists for CSLF. How, much, how many psychologists does CSLF have? I believe there's a budget for one that's mm -hmm. vacant, so they outsource that service. The third party. Thank you, Chair. And so there's no new new funding this year for a second? Uh, no, there's a vacancy in the first, so. <laughs> Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so just a question about the process of the budget. If you've got an empty position and let's say you you think you need another one, would you not add another position until one was full? Is that how that works? Or would you say we need two psychologists and move forward and see what happens with hiring? No, that they would bring forward their priorities uh, through the year and uh, additional funding that that area wasn't brought forward <coughs> as a, a pressing need compared to uh, the classroom teachers and the bus driver and the EAs. Yeah. Okay. Leave the third bird. I'm good for the section chair. Show Thank the section you. carry. Carry. Total of the commission, Scala, Dulon, Francais, 25,360,700 shall carry. Carry. All right, members, we've reached the uh, allotted time. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall carry. Carry. Madam Speaker, as Chair of a Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. I'll carry. Honorable yeah. Member from Kensington Malpeck. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I would like to call Motion 26 to the floor. Well, carry. Motion number 26. The member from Charlottetown Winslow moves, seconded by the member from Rustico Emerald, the following motion. Whereas improving access to health care is a priority and concern for islanders, and whereas there are well documented bottlenecks created at key access points in the health system, including doctor's offices, walk in clinics, and emergency rooms. And whereas these community pharmacies are trusted local partners in the delivery of health care, and whereas the province and island pharmacies have launched a new initiative called Pharmacy Plus that enables islanders to access basic health services like prescription renewals or common assessments through a trusted health care provider, and whereas launching the Pharmacy Plus program is a 
improving access to healthcare for thousands of islanders in their own communities. Therefore, be it resolved that this assembly endorse the Pharmacy Plus initiative as a means to improve access to healthcare for islanders and encourage the government to explore other innovative measures to improve access to health services for islanders. The Honourable Member from uh, Charlottetown, Winslow. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it is a, a pleasure to rise today and bring forward this motion, motion uh, 96 for debate. Um, you know, healthcare, uh, of course, is a topic that's uh, talked about quite a bit uh, in this legislature, and uh, rightfully so. And uh, this motion, uh, when it was originally tabled, I, I believe, was back in the spring. And, um, you know, I think that it's funny because sometimes healthcare and, uh, you know, it, doesn't have the, it's not always shone in the, in the brightest light and shone in the best. So I do think it's very important sometimes to highlight the things in healthcare that are, are, uh, are doing very well. And I do think that the Pharmacy Plus program has been one of those. It's, uh, you know, of course you hear from your constituents all the time and uh, you hear about like, lack, uh, having a lack of a doctor or a family physician. Um, you hear about a lot of the problems within healthcare, but sometimes, um, you know, it's nice when you actually hear people and you talk to them and you say, hey, have you heard of Pharmacy Plus? And they say, actually, yes, I did hear about that and I got to use it or I had to use it for this and it was actually very slick. And, you know, some people are uh, very good with that and some people are a little bit more kin. And uh, it's very much like the other different programs that are uh, out there. Um, and I always use the example of uh, Maple. Uh, you know, Maple has been a, a good program for uh, people who are on the registry who don't have access to a family doctor. But... You know, my parents are not a great example for that because, uh, as the uh, uh, as the speaker would know, uh, my parents live out in the uh, the suburbs of Murray Harbor down in Guernsey Cove, and uh, they uh, they don't have any high speed internet, so uh, that that program is not a, a great one for me. But um, I do uh, I do know that our Minister of Health is uh, is a numbers person. He stated that uh, numerous times and. Uh, I do remember him briefing, I can't remember if it was our caucus, uh, when the Pharmacy Plus program was initially launched, talking about, uh, you know, the number of hours that it took off of people who would typically have to wait in a waiting room um, or going into their doctor's office or uh, going into the emergency room. And, like, the number I found was staggering because any number that you can take people you know, having to go to, uh, for, for if, it's a, if it's a common thing or if it's, you know, I, I call it minor and I don't mean to, you know, to, to belittle anything because anything that's, uh, you know, something, anything that's bothering one individual, you know, might consider it minor, but to someone else it could be a very major thing. Um, I, uh, I, I do want to kind of mention about my most recent uh, health because uh, I had a lot of friends uh, who reached out to me yesterday. There was a picture with the uh, Minister of Education and I was in the background and I had a, a bandage on my nose and I, a lot of my friends were asking me, like, what's going on in there? And uh, they'd asked, but the member from Larry Inverness who had said that thought I might have gotten uh, roughed up in the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs loss to the Bruins, but it was not that. It was a hockey-related uh, injury, though. And uh, I did have to, thankfully, I did not have to use Pharmacy Plus. I just had to use a few little uh, stair strips myself. Yeah, and I will look the same way. Um... You know, uh, I do want to, uh, you know, one of the things that was mentioned in this is the bottlenecks and, um, you know, we do want to try to limit those bottlenecks. And I mentioned earlier that I do know that everyone in this, in this house, we, we will argue back and forth on health care and which is maybe the best way or, you know, I, I would, we, should, we would do it this way or we would do it this way. But I, I do genuinely think that every single person in this house, you know, does want the best for PEI. And this is one program that I think has been great. And I do hope that, you know, usually when you stand up with a motion like this, you, uh, I believe in the operative clause where it says, explore other innovative measures to improve access to health service for Islanders. Um, you know, one that I, I have talked about and I've talked to constituents and I've, I've gotten a little bit of pushback, I guess, from some originally, but now I think it's starting to see being adopted as the patient medical homes. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk initially when you would mention the patient medical home and people say, no, I need my, I need my family doctor. I need my, they know, they know my uh, record. They know, uh, you know, my, my, uh, they know everything about my health file, et cetera. And then you talk to some of the younger people and a lot of younger Islanders would say, no, I think it's great because, you know, there's, it's not so often that I need to go see a doctor. Um, 
And again, I don't want to talk too long on this because I would like uh, some other members to, uh, to talk about this uh, very important motion. Um, so the one thing I did want to talk about because, you know, while I have the chance to be on my feet right now is not a lot of people understand some of the things that are covered by Pharmacy Plus uh, or the common ailments um, through the program. So, and of course, I don't want to go through all of these, but, you know, there's a few like canker sores, uh, Paxlovid through COVID-19, um, dry eyes, eczema, which should just be mild to moderate. Um, going through some of these joint pain, muscle pain, nasal allergies, and there is a complete list. You can find this actually on the department's website. Um, I do think though by this creation of this new pathway, it has allowed the space you know, for those walk-in clinics and the emergency departments to be freed up. If you've spent any time in the emergency department, you know, it, it sometimes it can be a little bit of uh, a daunting uh, situation when you walk in, you're like, uh-oh, there's going to be a long line up here and, you know, I'm going to be waiting. And again, what I talked about earlier, Madam Speaker, was about, you know, it's something that's very important to me, but, you know, you might not see yourself as being an emergency. Um, you know, I, I am hoping that the Minister of Health might speak to this motion because I, again, would probably need a little bit of an update or a refresher on the number of hours that this has saved uh, Islanders, or, or maybe the number of users that have actually taken uh, part in the Pharmacy Plus program. Because, you know, I do think that this has been a win for healthcare. Um, my, the last thing that I do want to just talk about, just quickly, Madam Speaker, is, you know, my, my one of my backgrounds is in advertising um, and promotion and you know, it was funny, I would always talk to some of the clients when I used to uh, try to get uh, radio advertisements put on the, on the air, and, you know, a lot of times the, the business that I would be talking to and they would say, oh, you know what, I don't, I don't have any sales this week or I don't have any products I'm trying to push, and I would say, oh, no, that, that's fine. I said that, but I said, I read about you doing something in the newspaper, or I, I saw on Facebook there that you were, uh, you know, making a donation to such and such. And I said, that's a good message to pass along. I said, you should be telling people the great things that you were doing as well. Because I said, like, you know, oftentimes, as Islanders sometimes, I think it's, uh, you know, it's something that we sometimes will focus on some of the negatives. Um, but there are so many positives. Yeah. <laughs> Um, possibly. There are so many positives and there's so many good stories to tell and um, as I've, I have mentioned this to the Minister uh, before, I said, you know, it's very important to get out and try to tell those good stories and I do think that uh, Pharmacy Plus is one of those good stories in, in the health file, which uh, I do know a lot of number, a lot of Islanders have taken, uh, taken advantage of. So on that, uh, Madam Speaker, um, I look forward to and I do want to thank also the member from uh, Rustico Emerald who is uh, seconding this motion. So. I will uh, hope that everybody has a chance to speak to this, and I will, of course, ask for everyone's support. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Rustic Emerald second, seconding the motion. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I really am happy to, uh, to rise and second uh, this motion and, uh, and support this motion on Pharmacy Plus. Of course, moved by my Honourable Colleague from Charlottetown Winslow. I want to thank him for bringing it forward, the Government Whip. Um, so as we know, Madam Speaker, this motion aims to encourage the government and the Department of Health and Wellness to continue expanding and improving the Pharmacy Plus program that was introduced in the fall of, of 2022. Uh, looking at the text of the motion, um, it wants the assembly, we want the assembly to endorse this program and we want to encourage the government to explore other innovative measures to improve access to health services for Islanders and I'd like to talk a little bit about that later. So Madam Speaker, since the introduction of this program, it has only evolved and grown into something much more accessible and modernized. And today the program supports over 35 common ailments and out of over 60 pharmacies in our province, all the way from Tignes to Summerside, Kensington to Charlottetown, Stratford to Surrey. So 60 pharmacies province-wide can, can diagnose and treat 35 common ailments. And this, this is huge, exactly for the reasons outlined in, in the, uh, the motion, because this directly addresses the bottlenecks we have to people who are trying to access our walk-in clinics, or even worse, our emergency departments, to get help. Now they can go to the pharmacy instead and leave those walk-in clinics and emergency departments 
for, for people with true emergencies, especially the emergency department. So, um, Madam Speaker, I've watched this government and the Minister of Health and Wellness answer questions concerning the state of health care in our province, and, and equally, I have seen the many programs and initiatives that have been put into action in the, in the past five years. But Pharmacy Plus, and I, I want to give credit to the former uh, Minister of Health for all the great work he did, and the one before him, because this... This, this really is, this really is a, a, a team effort, and uh, I mean, you, you can go back and, and I'll, I'll, even, I'll even go back further prior to 2019, and the, the member from O'Leary in Verdes, I mean, he, did, he was part of, of what we built. Um, I'm not sure if the, the innovative side was quite as strong, but uh, maybe he'll, maybe he'll speak. Maybe he'll speak. I, 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 I do recall when, uh, when Robert Mitchell was Minister of Health. And uh, in 2018, they brought in the, the Maple Service and piloted it uh, up in Alberton. That, to me, that was a, a massive step forward. And of course, it's here today. And, and I don't mean to take away from the member, Madam Speaker, from Malaria Inverness, you know. Um, so, um, but Pharmacy Plus really is one of the most impactful and innovative programs to be created in our province recently. And I'm just so excited to watch it to grow and see and see the positive impact that it's had. Um, but as I mentioned, this motion, as my colleague has said as well, is to encourage the government to explore other innovative measures to improve access to health services for island residents. And I really think the Pharmacy Plus program uh, can can be integrated with some of the other new initiatives that we have in the province or, or, or some of the initiatives that, that have, have expanded and grown like Maple. So for example, um, Pharmacy Plus is getting traction, people are going there, but it can't help everybody. We're talking about 35 common ailments. Um, imagine if at a pharmacy there was a room where people could go in and have a little bit of help. It wouldn't have to be a medical professional. Someone who could log them into a computer and help them connect through Maple to try and access uh, the care they need. Um, because as we've heard, uh, the, uh, the mover of the motion said, you know, there are people who don't have high-speed internet at home, who aren't comfortable using computers, especially our seniors. And so if we had that service integrated at our pharmacies, which are across 60 different communities, that could be a spot where they could go to make that happen. Um, and that's, that's something uh, I would love to see the Department of Health and Wellness continue to push, uh, push for. I think, I think pharmacies would love it because it would have more people coming in and it would help them uh, increase the, the traffic in their area. And of course, we know pharmacies aren't just about healthcare. They're about all, uh, all kinds of products and services. So um, this integration and and uh, Maple, I think, is also just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to virtual care, and I think which could really be remote examinations, and I'll talk about more about that in a minute, uh, Madam Speaker. But also, I think this Pharmacy Plus program is going to be really key, and I think pharmacies are going to be a really key part of our patient medical homes. And I, I, think, I think it really, it really bears repeating what a patient medical home is. I know that uh, one of the trickiest parts of government and being an MLA in general is communicating government programs to constituents. And um, the way I like to, to put it is a patient medical home means you can make an appointment to see your health team instead of making an appointment to see a doctor directly. And then of course, the health team will help you out and um, if you don't need to see a doctor, you don't have to. It can take advantage of the full scope of practice of nurse practitioners and, and, and other health professionals, whether that be nurses, LPNs, or RNs, and also link in physiotherapists and, of course, pharmacists. And so you may have people who think they don't need to go to the emergency department right now or need to go to a walk-in <laughs> clinic right now, but if they go to a patient medical home, they can immediately be triaged and referred to go to the pharmacy where they can take advantage of the Pharmacy Plus program. Because not everybody would know that they would quali qualify for one of those 35 areas right off the bat. So I think this, this Pharmacy Plus program really is a building block that will allow these other services to, 
uh, innovative services to, to build, like patient medical homes and, of course, virtual uh, service with, uh, through, through Maple and, and more. So um, I wanted to talk, I, I guess, uh, a little bit more about patient medical homes and, um, and how pharmacies are, are, are leaning into them. I wanted to give a really a big shout out to an organization that's been around for 20 plus years up on the North Shore in, in the, uh, the Gulf Shore area of, of, of PEI where I represent and it's the Gulf Shore Community Health Corporation and they are an incorporated entity and they, uh, they've been advocating, like I said, for 20 plus years to have, originally it was a walk-in clinic um, really in, in the, uh, the Rustico area. They, they said the Gulf Shore, right? And um, in the past, of course, it was all about walk-in clinics, the traditional style that we're, that we're used to. Um, but to their credit, they kept on it and they were persistent and they were able to adapt. And in uh, 2019, they issued a 10-question survey to all the residents of the area um, to to try and, and illustrate what the needs were to, to, to collect data that could be given to the Department of Health and Wellness to show what the need was um, for medical services in the area. And this includes Pharmacy Plus, which of course came in in 2022, as well as Patient Medical Home. And they pushed and they, and they, they worked hard and uh, the former minister, the now Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure said, yes, I will meet with the Gulf Shore um, Community Health Corporation, I will review the survey, and, and he looked at it, and he saw what it supported, and he saw that it supported Pharmacy Plus, it supported a patient medical home, and I, I believe that data was one of the reasons that today we have a patient medical home that's coming into the Gulf Shore area in North Rustico, and it's a, it's a huge achievement, and thanks to the former minister and the current minister and the, and the administration, and... Um, it's important when we talk about these patient medical homes that uh, that we don't overpromise what they're going to write that down. Um, and we set the, the, the we we set the right expectations, and so that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing in my community because there's going to be a transition period. Okay. Um, so far, again, again, pharmacies are playing a key role. So. The, the patient medical home coming into North Rustico, it was the uh, Atlantic Medical Properties Limited that won the, the RFP, and, uh, or AMP uh, for short, that's acronym. And in fact, uh, they are directly uh, related to and owned by Murphy's Pharmacies, and they've been able to, uh, um, they're, they're the ones who are going to make this happen. Now, it's going to, there's going to be a transition period. First of all, it has to be built. <laughs> and um, as we know, that can be challenging. So right now, I think the, the most optimistic time frame for, for it to open would be, you know, January 2025. But I think it's really important that we're up front with everyone involved. And if that's the most optimistic deadline, then let's say, you know, by the, the fall of say 2025 in case there's deadlines. They've got to go through design, they've got to go through architecture, engineering, they've got to build it and uh, you know, barring any, any difficulties. Plus then um, uh, Atlantic Medical Properties is going to build it, they're not going to run it, although they have, they have that ability. They run a, a patient medical home over in Stratford. Um, then they need to turn it over to Health PEI and Health PEI has to get it outfitted up. So um, that, that's one thing I, I would, uh, I would say I really want to do is I want to set proper expectations and that's what I'm going to communicate to my constituents. And and in the meantime, when it comes to, to help, uh, Pharmacy Plus is, is a great option. So uh, the, other th the other thing um, is during this transition period, uh, we've got, we have it's called a clinic in North Rustico, but it's actually only open to patients of the, of the doctor that's there. Uh, we, and we do have a couple of, of issues going on there. And um, uh, for example, um, sometimes there are people who are, are at this medical center 
uh, and you can see them inside and you know they're there, but the door is locked and no one's being allowed in and that doesn't quite send the right message. So, I mean, I think that it, it's a, a sort of a common sense thing that we need to need to work on. And I, I'm working with the, the Minister of Health and Wellness on this to see if we, so we can improve some of these things. And um, we need to, uh, to make sure that obviously the RECs, which have been open for some time now to fill the positions that are needed for the patient medical home gets filled. And, and that's happening too. Um, and, and I think that uh, it's up to all of us when we're out and about and we're talking to people and we're especially making off-island connections, we continue to recruit people to those positions. But um, Madam Speaker, I did want to, to talk more uh, I'm giving one more final thank you to the Gulf Shore Community Health Corporation. I'd like to talk more about this idea of, of virtual care and how it can really be integrated with Pharmacy Plus and pharmacies on the island. So everybody knows Maple. And of course, Maple is not, you know, the definition of virtual care. It's a provider of virtual care telemedicine in Canada. And uh, I think... There's a massive, massive opportunity to expand beyond the video conference or telephone with a doctor to get to and use devices that will cause, will allow for true remote examinations. And all of this information I should mention is on bradtrivers.com if anyone wants to go and take a look at it. It's great. I would encourage you all, go to my website, subscribe. Some great posts coming up there. Some things you might have heard in the house. But, uh, Shameless. Um, but I, I wanted to talk uh, in particular, so uh, CADTH, C-A-D-T-H, uh, it's the, um, oh, the Canadian, it's a Canadian research uh, team. They, have, they did a paper in September 2023 talking about virtual care and remote examination, specifically in technology that supports it. And uh, I mean, listen to this. So this is, this is Tidal Care, which is a company that makes these devices. Um, handheld solution that enables on-site medical staff or patients to conduct medical exams remotely with a, cl a clinician for accurate diagnoses. Listen to heart and lung sounds. Look in the ear canal, throat, blood pressure, blood oxygen levels, weight, and more. So this technology exists. It's there, right? And, and so if you had the Pharmacy Plus program, you had the room in the pharmacy with not just maple, but you had these devices, and I, I'd, uh, I'd encourage you again, go to um, uh, titlecare.com and look at them. You can see these devices, they exist, they're there. Um, we can really make a dent into these bottleneck areas. And I, as I say, I think Pharmacy Plus is the launching pad for this, and our pharmacies as well. Um, so, Madam Speaker, uh, I would encourage everybody um, to talk about this and look into it and you know help lobby for it. I believe in the Department of Health and Wellness there is a group that uh, looks at innovative things like this and I'd, I'd love to hear more about that from the, the Minister of Health and Wellness. Hopefully he will speak to this. Um, and one last other innovative idea that uh, has been coming to me more and more often right now um, is people who say, you know, seniors in particular are ones that have a hard time when they have to go online and try and you skip the waiting room to book for going to a clinic because they don't necessarily have those online skills. Or they have to go and they have to go and wait in the cold for a clinic to open up because they want to get in line to make sure they don't get that spot and they just don't have the, the rigor to do that. Um, and even with Pharmacy Plus, if it's very crowded and packed, there can be long waits there. But the idea is one we could steal from uh, Access PEI. And we know that at Access PEI, for example, I believe at the Charlottetown location, it's Tuesday mornings are seniors only. So you know that if you're a senior, you can go Tuesday morning. It's not going to be packed. It's not going to be crowded. You're not going to be waiting for hours and hours. It's dedicated to you. The staff there that are expecting seniors, the expectation. You don't have someone you know, behind you who's saying, that senior take it so long, I just need to get to work, let's go on, you know. And maybe, maybe that's something we can do with our, our, uh, our pharmacies, our walk-in clinics, and uh, maybe even um, these, these maple rooms, and we could partner between the Department of Health and Wellness, maybe it could be at Access PEIs even, uh, 
the Department of Transportation, Infrastructure, Health and Wellness, and Social Development and Seniors and say, hey, we're going to offer um, you know, priority health for seniors at these locations at these specific times so you know that you can go there and get there. So uh, I'll throw that out and, uh, and maybe that's something that uh, some staff and government uh, can take a look at to see because obviously, Madam Speaker, there's, there's pros and cons to any idea. And uh, I, know, I know often I might be uh, accused of coming up and looking at the pros through a rosy lens, but I know there's lots of people in government who will throw out the cons. So, um, so Madam Speaker, uh, I believe that exploring these programs I've spoken of, as well as the imp with the implementation of new and modernized measures, we can really have have truly extraordinary impacts on the ability of islanders to access health care in a quick and timely manner. And the health services that have been made to islanders, especially Pharmacy Plus, are changing what health care looks like for islanders in an incredible way. And Madam Speaker, I was just reminded of another nonprofit organization that's being innovative. And this is the Sterling Women's Institute at the Stanley Bridge Hall. And what they're doing is they've, uh, they've applied for a bunch of uh, Living Well PEI grants through the uh, Department of Health and Wellness, which is fantastic. Again, it's hard to connect sometimes uh, organizations with government programs. And um, they're doing things like free meals, hot meals. They're doing cooking, like uh, how, to, how to cook with a slow cooker. They're doing yoga classes, all these sorts of things. But they, they said, you know, what we'd really like to do is we would like to have a health day maybe once or twice a week, again, maybe targeting seniors during the day, where seniors can go and they can check their, their health statistics. They can do things like take their blood pressure, maybe check their blood sugar, um, maybe height, weight, temperature, all these things, and record it and build up their own medical record so that they have that. And if they don't have a doctor and they have to go to a medical clinic, they have all those stats and they can show their doctor, look, and, and so this, this is the community, this is the Sterling Women's Institute and uh, Jen Steinhouse who's coming up with these ideas and her team. So kudos to them, because this is the sort of community input we need. And I thought it was just a fantastic idea. So um, I'm sure there's, again, I see the pros, I'm sure there's some cons there. But um, if we could partner with pharmacies and Pharmacy Plus and have someone from the pharmacy maybe coming into the Stanley Bridge Hall, to help with this sort of health check-in day, I think that would really dovetail things well together. And it would be a benefit for the pharmacy, a benefit for the people who could, who could go there. So uh, just another idea. Anyhow, it's pretty clear that uh, Pharmacy Plus, as this motion supports, has, has alleviated pressures on emergency departments. Um, it has assisted islanders who've lost a family doctor in the past, and it has given medical advice to people who arrived on PEI or those who have been waiting on the provincial patient registry. Um, and and, and uh, Madam Speaker, another thing that comes to mind is uh, I, I do hope that we are making progress on expanding the doctors that can actually be accessed through virtual health care or telemedicine, i.e. Maple. My understanding was was only doctors who are certified in the Maritimes that could be accessed through Maple. I hope, I hope we're making progress to expand that, you know, out to the rest of Canada. I know the Minister of Health and Wellness uh, works well with his, his colleagues across Canada, and hopefully we're going to come to an agreement, because that would, that would be massive. It would open up that many more, more doctors uh, to do that. Uh, the other thing, of course, is um, I really believe Maple should be available free of charge to those who do have a family doctor, not just those who are on the registry. <laughs> Um, I think it was, I think I have it in my blog, it was March 7th uh, last year when in fact that was the promise that was made. So I hope you're making some, some, some progress on that and, um, and uh, that, that again would just go that much further to, to removing those bottlenecks at the emergency department <laughs> as well as uh, at our walk-in clinics. So, Madam Speaker, I, I did want to emphasize that although I seem to be singing the praises of government and boasting about the health care system, which I think needs to happen more, honestly, right, we're doing some good, good work. And, and, and let me tell you, 
I, I'm, sure, I'm sure other MLAs would, would, would say the same thing. If you are a person who, act, who, ha, who accesses our health care system, it is bar none, I would say, the best in Canada. The people in Health PI in our system do a fantastic job. And it's nice, because I get messages from constituents, and I need to pass them on more honestly, about how great the care was that they had when they're in our health care system. Yes, we have barriers to get in there, but when you're in there, wow, is it ever fantastic. Um, I, I, I did want to say that that, as you can tell, I'm going to continue to advocate for progress needed in our hospitals, and I'm sure everyone else in here would as well, in our family doctor clinics and health PEI, in our pharmacies, and in every area of health care in our province. So, um, I, I really am proud to second this motion. I think it's important to talk about. I think it's really important that... Uh, we communicate the programs that government has out to islanders so that they can take advantage of them. And especially our nonprofit organizations that want to apply to things like Living Well, Live Well PEI. I think that Pharmacy Plus really is catching on and people are understanding it. I hope we can continue to expand that. And like I said, get that room in there where people can access Maple or maybe help, maybe even help uh, help people book at a clinic if, if the pharmacist can't help them you do skip the waiting room and maybe maybe we need to compensate pharmacists for that if they're spending the time to help someone on maple or you know i'm sure the pharmacists would say yeah we're not going to do that for free and and of course that's what did happen for many years as pharmacists because they are the health professionals that care about people they did provide a lot of these services for free for years so i i, I guess that's a good good point is I think our pharmacists don't get a lot of thank yous, and I do want to say thank you to our pharmacists. Yeah, they're, they're great community members, and they give back a lot. If you need that sponsorship for your sports team or that donation for that uh, community fundraiser, they're always there and, and helping out. So, um, so for, for the sake of those living in District 1, for those living in District uh, 27, for the newborn babies and for those living in our long-term care homes, for every single person who comes to Prince Edward Island, for every single islander who puts their trust in us as elected members of this house to serve them and support them, um, I want to thank the honourable member and my colleague from Charlotte on Winslow, the government whip, for bringing forward this motion. And I'm eager to hear what other members of this house have to say on this motion, as well as the Minister of, of Health and Wellness. So with that... Madam Speaker, I thank you, and I will relinquish the floor. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I don't need a lot of notes, um, probably to talk about pharmacists and their role in our community, as I've been married to one for 24 years. Um, it's, it's ironic, I have nothing to do with this motion today, but it's actually Pharmacy Appreciation Month uh, this week. And again, this looks like stage, but I'm going to read from the Instagram account of the PI Pharmacists Association, and I did not write this. I would like to nominate Margie McLean for my favorite PEI Pharmacy team member. Not only is she a great pharmacist and pharmacy manager at Murphy Stratford Pharmacy, but she is also the most loyal and caring person. On top of all her responsibilities, she goes above and beyond to take care of each patient to the best of her ability. There are many patients that ask for her by name each day. She also makes sure her staff feel appreciated and recognized for all the work they do to keep our busy store running. There are few, very few days that she doesn't stay late or come in early. Yeah. So, again, for my, for my wife, she actually started with, uh, with Ray at the age of 18 before she was accepted to uh, pharmacy school. So it is the only job that she's ever had and the only employer that she's ever had. Um, so I'm not going to say how long she's worked for Murphy's um, because um, uh, this is, <laughs> I don't think she'd be too happy, although she does not watch. It's, a, um, it's interesting to note um, that we met in her last year of pharmacy school over the holidays. And I, she reminds me consistently that I asked her, um, don't, all you do is just count pills. And I was successful to get a second date after saying something like that, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, so I survived that uh, open mouth, insert foot. 
um, from that perspective. It also should note, again, she has a type of job that it's very difficult to call in sick. Uh, since I've known her, I think she's called in sick twice um, over those X amount of years with Murphy's um, because uh, the way it's operated is difficult uh, to do that. Um, her career started actually um, at Parkdale, but she did move to Cornwall. If anybody uh, remembers the pharmacy on the corner at the lights, uh, Wayne Rogerson's uh, pharmacy, which was eventually sold to Ray, she did work there. But she moved on to be the manager at Stratford. Um, it's a little, little, a little bit like being a police officer, sometimes not to be in the community that you serve. Um, so she, she's been at uh, Stratford ever since. I tease Ray all the time. If I could only get her to move back to Cornwall, that my next election slogan would be elect Margie's husband because she is very popular. I even have some constituents that actually uh, live in Cornwall that still travel to Stratford to deal with my wife. So um, again, she's probably not going to listen to this, but if you see her on the street, please let me uh, tell her that I spoke about her uh, today um, as well. Um, it is a good chance to talk about Pharmacy Plus. Uh, I do like my numbers, and it was a result of our health innovation team, which is, you know, again, try to take innovative practices. So it was in October of 2022 that we stood up the Pharmacy Plus program. So since that time, there's some pretty staggering numbers. Um, we've completed over 91,000 assessments. We've seen more than 48,000 patients. Um, there is 49 participating pharmacies um, in 16 different communities. The average assessments per day is approaching 200 these days. So again, what, they do, what they're doing for our healthcare system cannot be um, undervalued. They are uh, giving access to people all the time. Um, she has done Pharmacy Plus in my kitchen. Somebody's called me and I said, just a second, I'll put my wife on speakerphone. And yes, she, can, uh, she will answer your questions. I had a um, constituent from the Minister of Education's um, District called me the other day, asked about a prescription renewal. <laughs> so I texted my wife and I called them back and I said, she's there till five o'clock and she'll be there uh, nine to five tomorrow and 12 to five on Sunday if you wanna go see her. So I wasn't aware of the particular prescription that uh, she does. I still think we have awareness to do on the uh, Pharmacy Plus program. Um, I don't think people, again, especially with pres prescription refills, um, I think some people are still not aware that certain ones, so I'd encourage everyone if you even think, uh, pick up the phone, um, try to read the drug name off the bottle if you can, pronounce it or spell it to your pharmacist, and they may save you a trip to a healthcare facility and you can uh, visit the pharmacy instead. So I would really encourage that. Um, for example, even back to my numbers, our pharmacist team since that date have renewed over 33,000 prescription renewals. So that's a lot of reduced wait times for a simple, simple procedure that um, to allow our physicians and nurse practitioners to do um, the, the very valuable work uh, that they do. Um, to talk about pharmacy again, I guess one of the initiatives that we have now is what we call prescribe IT. So basically we're integrating um, basically prescribe IT with our EMR system so that we can um, allow our physicians and nurse practitioners to uh, digital transmission of, of prescriptions. Again, this makes it more secure, um, it's in within our EMR record system for all to see. So this is an uh, important um, innovation that comes from that group as well. I think we're about 70% completed uh, integrating prescribed uh, IT in, in our community pharmacies. Um, so again, that's another efficiency, um, as, as the member from Rusco Elmer talked about, that we need to innovate, do things differently, make it a better experience um, for our patients. Um, again, I think what another uh, point to make about pharmacy is that last year we did add additional um, services. I want to make sure I get them right here for my notes. Um, in Patago for sure, shingles, and there's one more I'm missing that we added. Hormonal contraception. So those were added in July of this year, and even since July, um, they have been prescribed by um, pharmacists more than 800 times. So again, it's I would encourage everybody to jump on the Pharmacy Plus website or contact your your pharmacist. Uh, we have uh, also changed the 90-day uh, supply um, renewal process too to allow less visits uh, to save costs. 
um, for people accessing drugs. The $5 copay thing uh, on the pharmacy side uh, has been significant. I've gotten some great emails about the amount of money that the $5 copay has saved. I think so far we've saved Islanders about $2.3 million in implementing the copay program through, through pharmacy. So again, they do uh, provide such a valuable um, service to us. I mentioned it in the House uh, today that these people um, double, triple mass during COVID. Um, my wife did not miss really a day or two of work um, throughout that whole uh, the, the COVID, the, especially the early days of COVID, um, people need their prescriptions, so they have to access their pharmacy. And again, through Fiona, um, with the little mining flashlight on her head, she went to work and uh, did, her, did her job in the dark for two or three days um, so that people could get their meds uh, at the same time. So um, I also want to give a shout out, actually, uh, one of her employees got accepted to pharmacy school the other day. She just found out. So she uh, got accepted after their third year of university. So it does not require an undergrad. It's interesting to note we talk about education and all that, but my understanding is that the pharmacy program at Dow was only 70% full last year. So um, it is a great career. Um, it's very satisfying. Um, I feel like I'm with a celebrity sometimes when I go to Sam's and Cornwall or Smitty's. Um, especially with some seniors um, who, who uh, think a lot of my wife. So um, interesting to note, too, um, in my role, that actually the cost of the pharmacy program at Dow is almost the equivalent of the physician or the medicine program, which I think is a little disjointed. I'm not sure that has crept up over the years, but I think uh, it's worth, worthy of a conversation, and I think that's contributing to the 70% rate uh, for pharmacists. Um, that are entering that program. Um, it it's, can be expensive. Um, but again, I would encourage anybody that, um, my wife got in after one year of university, which was quite rare. Um, but there, um, again, back to Lindsay, who will be start, <laughs> starting this fall, um, has gotten in after uh, her third year of, of, of UPEI. So again, a, a great program to, uh, to take part in, in a great career um, in lots of places to to practice pharmacy within our system, both at medical homes, community pharmacists, um, back in community health, um, and again, even from a policy perspective, uh, perspective our pharmacare team is very important. Um, they're trained pharmacists that I have. Our assistant deputy has a background in, in pharmacy and has practiced pharmacy, I believe, in three provinces uh, as well. So she's a very valuable asset uh, to our team in understanding um, all the intricacies of, of pharmacy. Um, besides that, again, um, the numbers are quite significant. It is impactful, this program. Um, we do ask, I, I was, I always remain con concerned about the volume of work that our pharmacists do. Um, it's an extremely busy career. Um, sometimes, like say, my wife doesn't really have lunch a whole lot or she eats standing up um, at Stratford because it is one of the busiest pharmacies on PEI. Um, so again, back to list some of the things. And from a cost perspective, you know, it, it is, it's helping our system deliver services at, uh, I wouldn't say reduce cost, but uh, reduce pressures within our system, uh, reducing wait times uh, to access these services. So I think we're continuing to have conversations with the Pharmacist Association on how to add services. We've seen other provinces examine the strep throat. Um, uh, clinics that, that pharmacies are using, obviously, so some training and upskilling in order to provide that service to Islanders. Um, and again, I think we need to be careful that we don't uh, increase the scope of practice too fast uh, to, the, to this value profession um, because they are doing a lot of work for us now. And even the way they're distributed across PEI with 49, um, I, I don't think you're more than 15 minutes away from a pharmacy anywhere in Prince Edward Island. Um, that will give you um, some services that you need or give you the advice that you need. Um, 811, again, is another great service to get some advice to advise you whether you should go to a pharmacy or, or go to a, a clinic or an ER department. So I would encourage everybody to use those services as well um, so that if you are at a, um, present yourself at a pharmacy, that they can help you because um, it's important um, to do so. 
So in closing, again, I appreciate this. It, um, it's very timely. I did say to my staff that I, I have to do a minister statement or something about pharmacy this, this month or it won't be pleasant at home if I don't recognize um, this important group that my wife's a, a part of. Um, and again, um, I, I, we want to thank the Pharmacists Association for their, for their work on this file. It wasn't easy. I wasn't around. I, I knew it was a lot to get off the ground. A lot of conversations in, in talking with providers and nurse practitioners and physicians and pharmacists and how we were going to do this, how we we're going to do this safely, how we were going to do this in an efficient manner. And it's, it is, I do talk about it a lot. Um, I would encourage you with all your constituents, if you get a call regarding health care, to kind of ask a few questions to see if they can get uh, help at the pharmacy. And uh, I think it's an important service that they, that they uh, do um, provide. Um, and again, um, the Murphy Group, again, has been a great employer to my wife, Ray's a great person, talk about community involvement. Um, I don't think there's any stronger community person than, than Ray Murphy um, over the years. He's proven it over and over again, uh, giving back to his community. Um, so a little shout out to Ray. Um, although I did used to tease him a lot at one point when I had three young kids. My wife used to work every second weekend and I used to tell him that I really didn't like him every second weekend when I was home with the three young, my three young daughters at the time. Um, but it's since improved to, to one in three. So again, it's a great career to allow you some flexibility uh, to work some nights, some weekends, but have some days off um, to pursue other interests. So. Um, it's also important. Another thing, again, I would like to uh, recognize my wife is she's uh, one of the, the few pharmacists that participates in the PACE program. So what that is is that she has helped training pharmacists from other countries um, that come to Prince Edward Island that want to get licensed. And she's had some fantastic experiences. Um, she currently has a preceptor, I think they would call them now. I think it's an eight-week term where they uh, job shadow uh, with, uh, with her, and she really enjoys it. Um, she's, um, I think her latest physician is from Egypt. Um, first time you've seen snow, uh, so on and so forth. So I think it's, it's great that she wants to help train other physicians through this program um, to do it. Um, it's her way of giving back, and she really enjoys it. Um, and it does require her to do, uh, I think, write up about 30 assessments. So, so I, sometimes she'll, she'll go down to the basement and be on the computer for a while, kind of finishing up their assessment process of the PACE program. So again, uh, thanks to her for doing that to help train um, additional pharmacists. So anyway, thank you for bringing this. It's, it's again, very timely, and um, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, uh, West Royalty. Um, thank you. Madam Speaker, and, and uh, thanks for bringing this motion forward. I'm a member from Winslow and uh, the seconder. Uh, I'll have to check out that your website there uh, later on today. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I can't believe I haven't looked at it already. Um, uh, I, d I don't think PEI has enough bandwidth anymore to, to, to look at. Uh, for all of us to go in there and look at it at the same time. But, uh, and thank the minister, too, as well. Um, I, I just, uh, I want to, yeah, first stand up and, and, um, and you know, thank the hard-working pharmacists across Prince Edward Island and the pharmacist assistants, and, and they're very busy, and, you know, we don't understand stand the scope of, of what they do and how hard they work and how hard they've worked to, to make sure that islanders are, are healthy and, and um they continue to work diligently no matter what time it is or when it is, and their hours are a little bit different than ours, and they're, they're under high demand. <clears throat> so I want to say uh, thanks a lot for them. And this is, a, this is a, it's an evolution. Pharmacy Plus, is, I think, is an evolution of, of where pharmacy was, where it's going, and, and what, what the needs are that Islanders need at the minute. And I want to take a second to thank the former Minister of Health, and uh, we were just chatting about how uh, one, of, one of five, and, and the, it seems like we, the, their people are there for, for a short time and not necessarily a good time. But it's interesting to go back, and, and we've always known that, but we haven't wanted to overburden 
overburden uh, the pharmacists and what they're able to deliver uh, too quickly, as, as the minister said. Um, but I, I do, I do want to talk about a couple of, of issues that <coughs> came about, um, and to, to give another side of this, is that there, we have to understand that they're, they're under threat, and the Pharmacy Plus program is under threat at the, as, if we keep going. And I'm going to tell you why, because of the, the hiring practices that are being put in place to, to, to staff up our medical homes. So if you want to staff up uh, your, your medical homes, they have, the pharmacists have to come from somewhere. And medical homes are trying to give good care, but we're trying to get 30 up and operational. And if you're going to staff them with pharmacists, which nobody really knew what the scope of the medical home was, and we still don't even know what professionals are going to work there. If you want to move pharmacists from, from one position into a medical home, that's going to cause that's going to cause issues if you do not communicate with the pharmacist association and i know the minister said he did this is an important thing and this is not coming from me this is coming from professionals that are talking about this because they weren't consulted upon different moves this year and they've talked to this government and they've been to the highest levels and and they're they're sounding the alarm that we need balance and and it's true there's we said it before, there's, if you go and talk to a pharmacist, they're super busy and they're, they're, they're all over there um, working hard and the minister talked about all the locations and now you're, you're talking about medical homes. Are pharmacists part of each medical home or are they not? Is that in the model? I don't know. And that's something that you have to make sure you have a look at and um, that's a threat <coughs> to the, the, the Pharmacy Plus program, not for me but it's from, it's from the people in the field. And if you do not talk about this now before they, before they staff up, and I mean, I, I know you've already missed your, your, you've already declared you're missing your timelines for medical homes. I, I understand that. You, you talked about it this week where it was election promises and promises here, promises there. I mean, but we know we're not gonna get 30 medical homes by the end of the year as promised. You use that as a, as uh, an excuse to, 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 to keep going. You can't meet that goal. The hour has been called. Adjourn of debate. Seconder. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move by the a member from Rustico Emerald that this House do adjourn until March the 8th at 10 a.m. Shall it carry? Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>